What is up, large data bankers? Welcome back to the stream. Happy Friday. Hope you're all doing great. How's the music? A little loud now. A little bit loud. Travu up. It's nice to see you. Lisa, how's it going? Let me tell you, today, it's been a busy day, but pretty fun. I got out of the house. It's a rare thing on a Friday to get out of the house, I think. Why did I get out of the house? It was my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Thank you for bringing me into this world, <laughs> whenever that was, 100 years ago. Um, here's what we did. We went to high tea. Anybody know about high tea? It's pretty fun. Went to this new place called Brooklyn High Low. It's a little tea service place uh, that I guess I haven't been to before. You know, it was cute. You know what, you go in there, they serve you some tea. There's like little precious like plates everywhere and stuff like that. You know, you know how it goes with the high tea. They give you little sandwiches. They give you like a little like, hmm, a little scone with cream and jam and stuff like that. I thought that my mom would like that. I think that she liked it. It was cute. Um, I think that it wasn't the best tea service I've ever had, if I'm going to be honest. If I'm going to be honest, I've had some pretty good tea services. There's this place in Manhattan called Lady Mendel. Man, if you're ever in Manhattan and you feel like going to have tea, check out Lady Mendel. That place is like off the chain tea service wise. Good God. So good. <coughs> they give you different foods and it's the service is really nicely organized and they have they come around and like do stuff at certain times. It's very nicely. It's just good. You know, it's really good. This place, you know, they're still getting their footing. I wouldn't count them out. I'm still glad I went, but I wouldn't say that they've uh, they've completely figured out the pacing of that tea service. You know what I mean? I'm sounding like I really know a lot about tea service. I don't. It's just the sort of thing like the whole conceit of tea service is that it's perfect, right? It loves to be this precious little perfect thing. And I feel like if you don't if you don't approach perfect for a tea service, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to become a food critic. I don't think I know. I don't think I know how to be a food critic. Um, but that's okay. We can all be amateur food critics if we feel like it, right, guys? Anyway, um, well, Calder Bear, hello. M. Laswick, how's it going? Pratik, Mr. Casa. How was your Fridays? How was your weeks? What is everybody up to? Is it hot where you are right now in New York? Dude, it just got humid AF. Humid AF here in New York. All of a sudden, 80 degrees, 70% humidity kind of thing. That's out of control. I'm like sticking to myself. Uh, I don't have air conditioning in my room yet. I need to put my air conditioner in, test out that noise suppression on the new PC. Haven't had to use that yet, but we'll probably need it for the AC. Um, but yeah, it's gotten, I don't know. Like, let's see. see if I can, uh, You see this? 80 degrees, 63% humidity. So there you go. Nikon was on call and it was hell. Uh oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Did you have a lot of wake ups? It sounds like probably. First vaccine shot, 102 degree fever. Jeez, that's, uh, that's higher than I would expect for that first shot. I feel like most people. Most people have do pretty well for that first one, but it means that it's working, right? Pratik, it means you're getting protected. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. Now in process, switch your job, switch from Python to Go. Oh, that's cool, Travoa. Good luck. That's exciting. Python, it's great language. Go, great language. Try something new. Have a good time with it. Weekend deployment, repro a maybe bug with dispelling of external sort merge. Refuses to spill and hit SQL memory limit. Yeah, you know, that's that's interesting. I would definitely be interested to see that. We have a few cases, a few remaining cases that we thought were edge cases where we, we still can't spill. I think it's in the last one that we, I think we fixed this in, in aggregation. If you have a huge number of tiny groups, we had some trouble spilling that. Um, but I think that one was fixed. I think with sort merge, I didn't expect that we had uh, missing accounting, but if you can repro, that would be great. You probably know we're working on this stuff right now. So uh, all those reports, much appreciated. Maybe some accounting missing. 
wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Send send us the deets though, for real. Like this stuff is it's val very valuable. I have a new goal. I wanted to actually talk to you guys about this new goal. And it's it seems like an obvious goal, but it's not something that I had thought of. And it's related to this topic. It's related to what we've been doing on stream last couple of times. Um, the goal is that we should be able to run as as concurrent of a TPCH workload against the database as one would want and never crash, right? It doesn't sound that complicated, but that's the goal. I, and I think that for some reason, we never made that an explicit goal of our development. We never made that an explicit goal because we're focused, right? We're a OLTP focused database. That's our core wheelhouse, core wheelhouse. And we do good on those workloads and highly concurrent analytics workloads though, we do not do good on. Uh, we're still working on doing better on those. Um, and yeah, so if you run, that's what we were, were looking at the last couple streams. There's some queries in TPCH that if you throw highly concurrent TPCH workload, which by the way, no server, single server of any database would be able to respond efficiently to that amount of load on TPCH because it's just not a workload that makes sense to run super concurrently. So it's it's artificial and it's it's a stress test. It's an unrealistic stress test that no database we we don't expect Cockroach could handle it. Meaning like return queries of that kind of style. It's like it's like if you were to run like a giant mega aggregation over a terabyte, you wouldn't expect to be able to serve a thousand of those concurrently. It just wouldn't work, right? Um, but your database shouldn't crash, right? <laughs> and so that's that's the kind of thing that we're struggling with a little bit, learning to make that memory behavior in these circumstances a little bit better. And, you know, I think we're we're making some serious progress, some serious progress. This is some of the stuff we were looking at on stream. Um, I can show you. This is the issue that I've been using to track some of this stuff. Um, and we've we made some may, good progress, we made some good progress. We found uh, this PR here, fix intra query memory leaks in KV Fetcher and TXN KV Fetcher. This is a big one. This one, uh, this one was big. Uh, the idea with this one is that we were storing an extra batch in memory for every query. Just one extra batch, you know, a batch could be 100K. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if it's highly concurrent, it adds up. So we free this, and this this actually improved the behavior for one of the queries. And I think I have a feeling that if we concentrate on doing each of these queries at a time, making sure that we never run out of memory for each of them, we're going to be in a much better place with the concurrent analytic stuff. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Probably won't just be me. In fact, it definitely won't just be me. It's a team effort. Um, <laughs> this is a big team effort because it's it's pretty deep stuff. But uh, that's kind of what we're what we're at there. So. Yeah, so TPCH, by the way, to DOS um, is a standardized workload uh, that's about analytics queries. It's a decision support benchmark. And every, a lot of database people know about it because it's it's popular. It's got a reasonable mix of analytics -y workloads with a different bunch of different operators, bunch of different things. It's a, it's cool. It's a good good basic uh, analytics benchmark. How did I learn Go? I learned it on the job. But there's some good uh, resources if you just click uh, Go here in the stream. The stream is intimate. The camera is closer. No, this, the camera is no closer. The change is that maybe since the last time you were here to DOS, we were we upgraded to 1080p from 720p. Crash cockroach by sorting 10k rows with 128 kilobytes in each row. Seems unexpected. It seems like it's kind of the same thing that we're talking about a little bit. It's a little suspicious, though. It doesn't sound good. <laughs> we should fix that. Um, 10K rows when given 8 gigabytes. Yeah, I mean, so the question is what your max SQL memory setting is. I feel like that's the critical setting. That's the setting where you can you can kind of tweak what happens with it by lowering the max SQL memory is kind of uh, kind of how it works. If If there's issues with our accounting, it means that we're using more memory than we expect given a particular limit. And so if you, you tell the database to use less memory for SQL, it means that it'll hit that limit more quickly and it might help with this particular problem you're looking at. So I would look at that, the max SQL memory flag. It's a default. Does SQL 
reports less than one gigabyte used. Hmm, it's a bit it's a bit suspicious. Monitoring shows it does hit eight gigabytes. So is it would that be the eight gigabytes of RSS? This is definitely. I mean, if you remember like what we've been doing on the stream for a little bit. That's kind of the that's the debate, right? It's like if you if your RSS hits a high number, the question is why? Like who wasn't uh, go allocated? Which it might depend on which metric you're looking at, right? We could look at this as an example. That could be kind of fun. I could see if I could repro this uh, on the stream. Might be kind of fun. I had a couple of plans for the stream. One was just to tell you I did. I had an interesting couple of discoveries I wanted to chat about. Um, and then I thought that maybe I could come back to this PR that we did about a month ago, since we had some follow ups from some colleagues about making it more possible. Um, and then, um, yeah, maybe we could get to we could try to repro some of this sort issue. When doing a rollout upgrade, do connections gracefully finish the transactions before shutting down the node? Yes. So the way that that works is we have this this thing called draining interval, I believe, um, where when you signal the database to turn off, it will send a drain signal to all of the connections inside of the database, which will tell them to stop. It'll actually it won't tell them to stop. It'll tell them to once they're finished doing their work, the connections will be shut down so that the queries won't terminate randomly. Uh, but the sessions will be closed as soon as the queries are finished. And so that's, we I think that's called draining. There, there's a couple of related concepts. Um, but I think what we're talking about here is is what we call draining. And uh, the, I mean, what will happen on your client is that you will get connection closed messages, right? Um, your client's going to get like, oh, connection closed, connection closed. But hopefully if you're using a connection pool, which is kind of a requirement for using any distributed database or probably any database at all, um, the connection pool, next time you ask for a query, um, it will get this error connection closed, but then it'll transparently create a new connection under the hood. That's going to route to a different instance um, since you're using a load balancer, right? It's they, All these things have to coordinate the connection pool, the load balancer, and the database. But if you're doing all that, then uh, I think it should be good. One exception is that if you have a lot of long running queries, um, you might have to adjust the timeout. I think by default, maybe we wait for one minute before turning off the note, like wait for all the queries to finish or until one minute elapses, which is whichever comes first. And so if one minute elapses, we're going to terminate the, the the queries, I think, something like that. Um, but that's tunable. It's a cluster setting. Hey, Juice Cop, Hydron, how's it going? Matt Murr, that project thing is a bit out of date. I should probably... The thing is, I don't exactly know what my project is today, <laughs> so I haven't updated it. It's going to be a bit of a melange. Any resources you can recommend for someone who wants to learn more about distributed data systems and databases? I like to use this. Is my keyboard not working? DB books. Um, I've got a couple of good resources here. I don't have too many specific to distributed systems in this list, but I think this is a decent list to start out with looking at databases. Um, yeah, I'm actually curious. I'm actually curious to reproduce um, M. Lazowick's uh, sort issue. So was that a was that a a single node that you were playing with or like a cluster? I wonder if I can just re reproduce that on a single node. It should be pretty easy to try out. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna do it on a remote node, and we can we can play with it. It sounds, if it's as easily reproducible as you claim, it could be a good case study. Try to improve things. But uh, yeah, so, oh yeah. Okay, so here's the cool thing that we figured out, guys. So one thing that we struggle with, and we've struggled with for a little while, is that, especially with these memory issues, sometimes what happens is if the database crashes, and you take a heap profile at the very last second before it runs out of memory, the heap profile in Go will have seemingly incomplete information. So maybe maybe your, your Go will re be reporting like, hey, I am using eight gigabytes, just like the example. And your RSS will say, I'm using eight gigabytes. 
um, like your example, but the heat profile that you took right before the database crashed, will say that you're only using one to two gigabytes, right? And that question is always like, what the heck? What is that about at all? It seems wrong. And I, I think I have a reasonable hypothesis at this point for why that's going on. Um, and it's basically, it has to do with, um, what's going on here? Uh, Python, why is there, do I need to rebase here? Uh, maybe that will fix it. So here, here's, here's, uh, here's my hypothesis for why the heat profile is looking a little bit suspicious these days a lot. And it's, it's because of the way that goes heap profiler actually works in terms of sampling. Um, so let's, let's take a look at go heap profiler sample rate. Um, mm -mm. what is the name of this thing called again? It's called, uh, sampled with the probability one mem profile rate. So if I go ahead and take a look at mem profile rate. Uh, what is this? This is called malloc.go. Go. Mm. Sometimes the, the, you have to like trick it by being like, Hey, I'm using the runtime or it's that it's still indexing. Okay. I haven't, I haven't touched my ID in a little while. Everything's a little bit, uh, we're still indexing, still indexing eight gigabytes dash dash M in Docker. Yeah, it makes sense. I feel like maybe, okay. You happy now? Okay. Maybe you happy now you're, you're still indexing over and over. Why is that? Did I, maybe there's some new excludes that I need to add or something. What is going on? What is going on? This one needs to be excluded, maybe. We changed a little bit about the way that the uh, the UI build system works, and I'm wondering if uh, something is playing havoc with my uh, my IDE here a little bit. I'm not sure what's going on. Like, as you can see, it keeps, uh, okay. Well, whatever. So I'm, I, I have a, okay. All right. Hold on. Hold on. We're almost getting to the place that we want to be. I want to be looking at this heap profiler rate flag so that we can understand how it works. For some reason I'm having an issue just like seeing the various files. Like it's, it's not indexing the runtime anymore, which it usually does. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So mem profile rate, mem profile rate. So what is mem profile rate? Mem profile rate controls the fraction of memory allocations that are recorded and reported in the memory profile. The profiler aims to sample an average of one allocation per mem profile rate bytes allocated. So what does this mean? By default, the mem profile rate is set to 512 kilobytes, right? 512 times 1024 bytes. And so what that means is that it aims to sample an average of one allocation per 512 kilobytes. But check this out. Let's say we have a lot of tiny objects. So let's say our object is only of size, let's say 256 bytes, right? So you have to get two times a thousand to every 2000 objects of size, 256 bytes, you're going to get a single allocation sample, right? And so then at the same time, let's also say that you're allocating a ton of big objects. So maybe 512 kilobyte objects. So every single object of that size gets sampled. 
I think that we're going to undersample the tiny objects. And so what I think is going on with these heat profiles when they don't show all the memory that we expect is actually that we're systematically undersampling tiny objects. And so if you have a ton of tiny objects in memory, and those are the ones that's using up all the memory in your program, you're not going to notice because of this undersampling issue. It's like a small object sampling bias. So, and what's more is that given what I know about when we have difficulties with memory accounting in Cockroach, um, it's all about the part of the system that hasn't yet, I think, been switched to use the vectorized engine, which has clear object lifetimes in vectorize. In vectorize, all of the column chunks, um, they're big objects, and they live and die at pretty clear points in the program. Whereas in the old engine, each datum is an object, and it's also tiny. And the lifetime of that datum is very unclear. And so my hypothesis is that when we see these out of memory things with weird, confusing conditions, it's because we're still using the parts of the engine that haven't been switched to vectorized and that they also don't show up in the heat profile. It kind of makes sense. Like there's, there's two sort of factors there that are making me think that I sort of understand maybe hopefully a little bit more about why that's happening. And, um, I actually wrote about it a little bit over here, um, in one of these issues. So, so the join reader is this part of the engine that it's one of the last parts of the row execution engine that hasn't been moved to vectorized. And it's also crucially a piece that use, gets used in a lot of queries. Anytime that there's a query that needs to do a join that doesn't have to use a hash join or a merge join, since it's a small, it's like a big right side table and a small left side table, we always use this join reader. And a lot of queries in TPCH use join reader. And those queries that do use join reader in TPCH, they're particularly egregious about causing out of memory conditions. So right now what I'm thinking is that this join reader, we've got to improve the memory accounting, which we're going to do um, as a matter of course. But then I would like to migrate this thing to vectorize at some point. And I do think that that's going to improve matters quite a bit. Rewrite the rest of the code. Exactly. Try including the disks inside of cluster UI. I think this one is already marked as exclude. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay, so I think this is back to working and I just need to uh, get rid of this change that I made. That makes no sense. Delete that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, rewrite the rest of the code. That's the dream, Oscar. That is truly the dream. And thank you for the follows. None too happy, syscall and Ms. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this binary up on our remote machine. I guess we only need to really put it on one of the machines, but that's okay. We'll just do all three in case, in case we want to do something more sophisticated. I just love that forehead emote. It's just so innocent. He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, guys. <laughs> it's a good one. OK, uh, Roach Prod SSH Jordan test one. All right, so let's do Cockroach. Well, let's actually, we'll do Roach Prod start Jordan test one. And then we'll do roach prod SSH Jordan test one again, cockroach SQL. Okay, so let's see here. Let's go back up to the test case here. Ah, so JSON. JSON is also sometimes a bit of thing that is a little bit difficult. Okay, so base64 of 128 kilobytes of random data. So let's see. Why don't we go ahead and generate the random data in a very non-random way? Um, what we're going to do is say something like this. Grab this. We're going to concatenate it with um, OK. OK, OK, OK. Let's see. So we, we, if we said something like select star from 
generate series one through 1000 G of G where, no, no, we're going to say select, not select star. We're going to say repeat hi. And you said 128 kilobytes, eh? So it's going to be something like 128 times 1024. No, except these are two characters. So it's actually 64 times 124. Um, and we're going to say select length of repeat. So it won't totally crash. Does this work? Okay. So this works fine. Channel your inner Shia to just do it. Okay. So we're going to do something like this. We're going to say create table. Uh, 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 create table T ID, UUID, primary key, default, gen, random, UUID, T timestamp, default now, B, JSON, B, default. And then we're going to do this weird thing. We're going to say, well, we, oh, I see. We don't want to put a default. We're going to go like this as, um, Yeah, so I think what we need to do is remove the types here. And then we're going to say select gen random UUID comma now comma repeat. Except we have to turn this into JSON, right? So we have to say value and we're just, we're going to create it from a string kind of. So we're going to say like this, we're going to close our quote. We're going to concatenate it with repeat. We're going to concatenate this with end quote, end bracket, quote again. Does this work? The problem is that I need to get rid of the types because create table as is weird and it doesn't need, it doesn't want to see types. Okay, unsupported operator string. Wait, I thought that was how you concatenated strings. How do you do it again? Is it select foo plus foo? I thought it was this pipe, or is it two pipes? There we go, it's two pipes. Okay, so come back over here. Um, go like this, two pipes. All right, so that's now gonna work. But I think text, JSON is more interesting because I think JSON is a little bit trickier for the database to handle. It's got to decode and encode, and that's expensive. Okay, so now we've got 1000 rows and what we really want was more than 1000 rows didn't we want something more like we wanted something like what did you say here 12k rows of that okay so we're gonna repeat this basically 11 times so we're gonna say insert into t values well like this select So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Multiply with more memory. Yeah, we'll we'll try this for now. We'll see where it takes us. Um, this these machines do have more memory, but out of curiosity, I do want to see what happens first. And so the the query was to now sort it by the t value. Select. So let's see. How do I do this so it doesn't just spam stuff to my Thing. It, maybe what we can do is, I guess I kind of have to do select T from T order by T desk. Explain analyze to SQL. Well, so you can't use top 10. If you do top 10, it's going to use a different algorithm. That's much cheaper. It uses something called top K sort for that, which doesn't have to hold everything in memory. It's like a streaming sort. Um, we can try to do an explain analyze. All right. So let's see here. KV bytes read 1.5 gigabytes. Rose output max memory allocated 400 kilobytes. Hmm. Hmm. So I think the, the reason that this isn't expensive is that we aren't doing, we aren't. Yeah, exactly. We're not using the JSON here. We're just, we can project out the JSON. 
The only problem is that I think what I want to do here is I can say, because I don't want to spam all of that JSON output to the screen just because it'll be like really annoying. So I think what I can do, there's a trick. You can say prepare X as select star from T order by T desk. Oh, explain doesn't print. I see. You can also use this trick. Then I can say execute X discard rows. And then that'll actually do the work and we'll see if it crashes everything. It does look like it's a lot more expensive than the first one. Um, Roach prod SSH Jordan test one. So it's using a good chunk of memory. It's using a good chunk of memory and it did succeed, but to your point, it's using more memory than we probably expected. It's using definitely more memory than we expected because yeah, good, good reasons for that. So let's go ahead and now take a look at what could be going on. So let's see here, SSH dash, you know, I kind of, I kind of think I already have a hunch about what's going on and it's so related to what I was just talking about. And it's really a sad, hold on, um, 26258, is it? Um, so let's go over here, localhost 26258. So taking a look at our heap profile, the classic for jump SSH command. <laughs> Taking a look at our heat profile, it seems like this stuff is probably actually garbage collected by now, but it hasn't needed to do any garbage collection. Let's take a look at just the main uh, dashboard here. Um, and What I wanted to see was what? Runtime? See? Yeah, so we haven't done a garbage collection. And so this stuff is still like, it claims to be resident. Here's another super confusing thing about heap profiles is that heap profiles contain garbage. Um, so if the garbage collector just hasn't run yet, then you'll think that you're retaining a lot more than you actually are. With limit X, it fix in, yeah. So the reason that it would fit in memory with limit X is that it uses a more efficient algorithm called top K sort. With top K sort, you only ever have to store K values in memory. Um, so you don't have to do a global sort, which is much, much cheaper. So if you, if you can do that limit, it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be something that you want to do. So the reason that, oh, you limit X plus one uses over two gigabytes. So, and is there a particular value of X that you found that it's the discontinuity? That's pretty interesting. I wonder what that's about. That's pretty interesting. See, it's annoying. I want it to just run a garbage collection and, uh, how do I force it to run a garbage collection? I wonder, wonder if I, I wonder if I run the couple of these, maybe it'll garbage collect. Have you garbage collected yet? Little buddy, little buddy needs to come take out the trash. There we go. The little buddy took out the trash. Current workaround on prod is to raise work mem. I see. So you're basically saying that the top case built to disc is inefficient and it breaks everything. <laughs> that sounds not unlikely. Um, it sounds not unlikely. Interesting, interesting, very interesting. So let's take a look at some things. The prod query doesn't do limit. Sure. But you're saying that there, there's a, there's a, if the sort is big enough, it spills to disk. And if it spills to disk, then the memory usage is inefficient, something like that. Out of curiosity, let's take a look at our, whoops, let's get rid of this. Taking a look at our SQL dashboard. I think we have a new graph that tells us about 
disc spells, don't we? Thought we had that somewhere. Mm, maybe it's just not something that we've added to the main dashboard yet. Let's see. Spilled. Okay, so this is our chart. The number of queries that spilled is 23. So perhaps is this saying that I don't think this has to spill, right? I think if I said this, then it would tell me. I think that we added a thing that tells me when a query has spilled and it wouldn't make sense that this one had to spill. I don't think. Although it's also annoying that this thing doesn't tell me how much memory was used. Why is that? Did have it in here and we haven't added it to Max memory allocated 410 kilobytes. So I guess the other thing that you had suggested, which seems reasonable, is to run explain on the bigger query, right? So we could say, yeah, 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 no, I know. It did the explain on the old one. Um, yeah, it's a bit mysterious. I think that this is a questionable quantity. 23 as a value? That doesn't make much sense. Something to dig in here. At least it goes up. <laughs> so here we say, yeah, we still don't have the, still don't have the memory used on the, on the sort. We need to fix that. That's annoying. We definitely have to do better here. Um, so we've got to add the memory usage to explain analyze, even if it's in the text only mode. Okay. So then if we go to the disql one though, we should get more in information. I think, yeah, maybe we should, um, hmm. how come this thing isn't like automatically opening my browser when I click on it? That's a question. So it claims to have used 660 megabytes of memory and 92 max amount of disk usage, which doesn't seem right, right? I, I would agree with the, what you're saying, which is that that seems pretty wrong considering the fact that when we look at our runtime graph, We're going to see a bigger spike in a second when this thing updates. Well, so here's another question. I, I have a hypothesis, which is that if I were to run this entire thing without JSON, we would see slightly different result. But you know what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make it so that we can crash the database with this. We, I, I want to see if I can actually even reproduce that. I want to see if I can even reproduce that. So I'll just insert a bunch more of this data. 
I have a feeling this is like a JSON thing. I just have a hunch. I have a hunch. This thing has like 16, 15 or 14 or 16 gigs or something. Um, cat, proc, mems, mem info. Mem total. KB to GB. Ooh, you know, that's a good point. I did not specify the type and I didn't cast it to JSON. So I think it is probably using text right now. So that would be even more interesting. It's a simpler case to repro. So let's let's actually just go ahead and keep doing this and then see if things still work with a big sort afterwards. I feel like they should, but I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Getting um killed because your code uses too much memory. Accidentally cloning the Linux kernel into a RAM disk. <laughs> uh, that's kind of like the Linux kernel eating itself, right, Sora? Well, big yikes, dude. This is feeling like a pretty big yikes. So easy repro, easy repro. You know what we should do is we should test out our view core tooling on this because this is this is seems pretty simple. Um, it's kind of like yeah, it's kind of combining another weakness of ours, which is wide rows. <laughs> wide rows is a bit of a weakness. Okay, so let's let's try to do this thing up again, and what we're gonna do is let's see what we're going to do here is basically run this query and you know what we should also do hold on okay we need to we need to get our whole our whole tooling up into place that we've been working on here so let's let's actually go and check out this mem whip thing. Um, and we're going to get check out master. We're going to say get cherry pick this thing. So we need this guy to be able to have a core that we can inspect. Get cherry pick this thing and then this thing. And we need this thing so we can use our little stats viz that we like to play with. Windows binary will get out of experimental status. I we don't have a we don't have a concrete plan to do that, to be honest. Um, nobody's really working on making Windows non-experimental. We definitely recommend that you run on Linux. Um Uh, let's see, how do I uh, go make vendor rebuild? Problems with partition merging? Yeah, that sounds likely, honestly. What's up, so Moni? I wouldn't I wouldn't run cockroach in WSL probably. I think it's probably something about cleanup that we're missing, likely. I'm also a bit surprised. Hmm. What is this? Man, I'm always having problems with the vendor stuff. I honestly What does this even mean? What if I just run it again? Yeah, I think the problem is either that we have missing accounting or it's something's not getting freed. It could be one of either. Could be one of either. Unfortunately, I don't know what this means. 
module path does not exist, RG quick test. Uh, so this thing did change go.mod. Do I have to run? This is going to break stuff, I thought, but oh, it didn't break anything. Now I can run make vendor rebuild again, maybe. There we go. Okay, I don't know why that would be necessary, but it doesn't matter much. Accounting would be okay if there was no cleaning bug. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Very well could be. Ooh, this is new. There's a little bit of a blue looking emoji there. Hmm, what is all this stuff? I'm wondering why we have to rebuild all of this JavaScript stuff. Maybe something changed in the commit that I pulled. Maybe it must be something like that. Yeah, we'll see. Well, we'll see. Hmm. You know what's kind of no nice that I just noticed is that they uh, they changed on the, on the Twitch dashboard thing. You see where it's like, it's got these little hearts. These, these hearts are now pink. They're very cute. It used to be like, I don't know. It was something less cute. Now it's like kind of cute looking. Anyway, that's just what I noticed while I'm waiting for this thing to finish building. It's also weird that it, it said this already. Why did it say this twice, I wonder? Build processes, man. They're Node M production, webpack, mode production. Node M production, webpack, mode production. Hmm. Oh, this was cluster UI yarn build, and this one was Cluster UI yarn build. It feels like maybe there's something that needs to be a bit adjusted in the old make file. The old make file needs a little bit of poking at maybe, but it looks like we're almost done now. Okay. Now we just have to recompile all the go. You know what guys, it's good that I have this fast computer because this is, this is happening on the fast computer. You on the slow computer, this would take longer surprisingly. Not just the tooling. Yeah, I think I think that there's Webpack, man. That I hear that there's some better tools than Webpack out there. People like this thing called ES Build, but I think it's kind of hard to um, hard to make it work. Okay, so let's let's uh, push this binary up. Do you like Windows or Mac OS more? I'm actually surprisingly and shockingly enjoying Windows right now. I think from a usability standpoint, Mac is probably on top but I'm enjoying Windows quite a bit these days from for the perspective of this stream. Um, X-File busy. Okay, I need to turn off the uh, turn off the instance here. Okay, try again. What is that little lyric smart? So cute. I like that cat. All right. So now that we've got our better tooling, let's let's go ahead and start. We're going to go ahead and SQL. All right. So we're going to go ahead and actually do it with the prepare execute one. Cause what if, what if it's actually something wrong with the explain analyze? I kind of doubt it. Let's make sure that we can reproduce with the execute discard rows because it's a little bit simpler than the explain analyze, which has to do all sorts of extra stuff. Uh, 
Memory usage is creeping up. I expect it to crash. Seems like it's gonna crash. Okay, so let's go over here and go to our stats viz, if we still can. Definitely seems like something's using way too much memory. All right, so we can reproduce this with just execute, which is great. So we're gonna we're gonna restart the database here. Roach prod start Jordan test one. We're gonna run our SQL. All right, so now here's what we're gonna do next. Here's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna we're gonna have a second connection open to the our node. We're going to kill the node while it's running, and then we're going to look at its core. That's the plan. Thanks to this view core runner thing, which is really the best thing of all time. It's really helpful. Glad that we have that. So what we're going to do is run this again. We're going to say prepare first. We're going to run execute. We're going to watch the memory grow rapidly, and then I think we're ready to kill it right away. So we're going to say kill all sig seg v cockroach. All right, so this thing is now dead. Now let's take a look at mount data one cores. And now we're, we're watching this thing dump its core, which is cool. Eventually it'll stop. And okay, it's done dumping its core. It's eight gigabytes, which is pretty big, but that shouldn't stop us. Um, and why is this thing still trying to connect? Just started to rain really hard. You see how it got all dark? It's because it's raining a lot. Very exciting. Um, so next step is that we're going to examine the yeah the messages are from port, port forward for sure but normally it means that there's a window open trying to talk like f on the web it's like probably one of these ones it's just annoying it's kind of in the way i think closing those is probably going to fix it okay so next up what we're going to do is put our view core binary um z view core first We're going to SSH again. Into over a data banks throughout the world. Then we're going to run view core. We're going to pass in our mount data one cores, this thing, the XC cockroach. And then while this thing runs, thank you guys for the follows. I'm going to use the bathroom and I'll be right back. Mm -mm 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 -mm.
All right, I'm back. Wow, it's really insanely rainy right now. Like, geez louise. I don't even know. It's like hurricane status. If the stream dies, you know what happened. I was taken by hurricane. All righty. So, hey, view core finished. That's exciting. So let's go ahead and run some stuff on it. We're going to run breakdown. So we can see that five gigabytes are live. 1.4 gigabytes are garbage. So that's good. It means we got live memory to play with. Next up, we're going to we're going to type histogram. Top 50. See what happens. I wish that I had a camera that I could point out the window because it's wild out there, you guys. It's wild out there. All right. So check out what we've got here. We've got a couple of enormous bite slices. Very suspicious. We have 157 megabytes, nine of them, 134 megabytes, nine of them, 134 megabytes, nine of them. Buy another camera. You know what I want? Isn't there something called like OBS.ninja? How does this work? I could like point my phone cam, whatever. I don't want to do it. It takes too much work. All right. So the next question is who's owning these guys, right? So can I say something like, I'm going to say something like peak this thing. See if it gives me anything back. May or may not. This peak thing is something I added. It's supposed to give you for a given type, all the things that point to it. It's got to initialize the reverse object graph, which takes some time. But once it's done for the first time, it should be quick. Wow, it's really pouring. It's really quite. Hold on, can I? Can you, can you hear this? It's wet. I don't know what to say. Genuine water. You, you probably can't really see it. Okay, hold on. Let me... This also happens sometimes. You gotta refocus the camera on one's face. Alrighty. Anyway, um, so let's see, what does Peak say? Peak says, just as you say, M. Laswick, that these big slices are being retained by something called Disk Q Writer. And there's nine of them. Hearing the thunder rumble twice from outside your window and then from the stream in a second delay. So you must, you're in New York too then? <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. So let's, let's take a look at Disk Q writer. Whoops, I have to put the whole object path. This is something I've meant to fix. It would be great to have this work as a regex. But this disk queue writer, it has there's 17 disk queue writers and then together they retain 2.6 gigabytes plus this stuff, which is a lot. And somehow this adds up to five gigabytes, which is confusing. Oh. Hmm. Interestingly, okay, this is interesting. Look, the disk queue writer retains these two, but then there's a third type that isn't retained by disk queue writer. Let's take out who's retaining this one. This one is retained by disk queue itself and something called memory.buffer. Hmm. And so according to 
How does this stuff even work? It's nothing, nothing I've ever really looked into, to be honest. Okay, let us take a look. Disk Q. So actually, you know what I also want to do? I'm going to run HTML. I'm going to go over here to localhost. Dude, the view core thing is out of control good. I don't even know. It's just incredibly good. Start serving on 8080, but then I can't connect to it. What does that mean? Uh, oh, it's because I mapped 8080 to 26258. That's terribly annoying. I think it's going to mean that I have to probably restart ViewCore, which is really sad for me. Um, yeah, I'll just do that. Whatever. No, no big deal. Just rerun that real quick. So this needs to go to 8080. Do you guys see how good this view core thing is? Oh my gosh, it's it's out of control. Look how quickly we can find the answer to these questions. It just feels like a big advance, a big advance. So while this is going, we're going to go over to disk queue. We're going to try to understand. Picked a good time to hit the bug. Yeah, you really did, honestly. You really did. Um, So, so there's a lot to look at here. Um, I think what we need to do is wait until this thing is ready. So we're going to run HTML again. We're going to go to types. This is going to now view core is not in house. Um, it's actually something that's part of golang debug but i've been working on updating it so if you want to play with it you can use you need this pull request or else it doesn't work at all um, and then i actually have some further improvements in this branch over here i i actually got in contact with the go team um about getting or figuring out what the future of this repo is because it's been a little bit of a challenge to get them to merge the bug fixes. Um, and I, so we start, I think I have started at least a constructive dialogue with some of them, which is exciting. I think, I think basically it sounds like they have interest in maintaining this and providing this thing as a library. It's just, they, they don't exactly have the resources to do it. And so I don't know if we, I really have the resources to do an amazingly good job on it, but at least it's good that, uh, that they are interested in it in some theoretical universe. So let's take a look at disk Q. So there's a bunch of these disk queues. And each of them has a disk queue writer. Oh, the reason this is slow is that it's got to still initialize the reverse object graph, which it just did. And this disk queue writer has a pointer to a buffer. And the buffer is huge. The buffer is mega big. So my first question, is this buffer being accounted for? Kind of seems like the answer is just probably no. It probably just were ignoring accounting for this stuff, which is not good. Um, right? Here's our buffer. So when we write to our buffer, who's doing this? What interface is this? It's a, it's just a writer. Interesting. It's interesting. So numbytes buffered disk queue. It sort of seems like the, the way this is supposed to work is that there's a higher level object, the disk queue that's calling these writers and it's supposedly going to actually disk queue writer. It's, it wants to be keeping track on the outside, I think is probably what's going on here. And for some reason that's not happening. So where I'm a bit confused where we actually are using this thing though. Uh, Compress and flush. Who, who calls this thing? 
Serializer.finish, right footer and flush. Rotate file. Yeah, I don't know how this stuff works even a little bit right now. New disk queue. Okay, why don't we take a look at the users then, maybe. New disk queue. Speaking of which, who is using this thing? So if I come back up, who owns this guy? This is a partition, a call container dot partition. And this is owned by the partitioned disk queue. Okay. So the partitioned disk queue, fascinating. How does it work? In queue. New disk queue, add it to a list. Okay, but we still haven't written anything yet. In queue, I think is the one that does it seemingly. It takes a batch. If is already done, right footer and flush. But where do we write, ah, append batch. Batch to arrow, serialize. Then we have something called body len and RB is what? Record batch serializer. And this thing is writing to So who's owning this stuff in the end though? It's it's not. So partition disk queue owns. It owns a bunch of partitions. Each of the partitions have a partition state. Each of the partition state is a disk queue. And each of the disk queue owns Is this the big one? It's something called scratch decompressed read bytes. Okay, so maybe it's like we're not accounting for our scratch memory, something like that. Which seems a little bit unfortunate. So there's our scratch decompressed read bytes that we need to be keeping track of, and it's our disk queue writers buffer.buff that's also maybe possibly giant. So there's two things, right? And our compressed buff is also big. So there's a lot of big stuff here. It's a bit concerning, TBQH. Thank you, by the way, M. Laswick. Very much appreciated you pointing me to this. Uh, you should. You deserve some sort of uh, bug finding prize. Ginny Pie, how did I get started programming? Um, I got started because I was a young, well, it's a bit of a story, which I won't tell all of it right now. It started out because I liked playing this game called NetHack. You guys know NetHack? Great game. Top-down rogue-like dungeon crawler. I met a bunch of people who also liked playing that game. They liked to script it with Perl. So I learned Perl in high school to play around with NetHack. You know, talked with them, chatted with them, blah, blah, blah. Started getting interested in it, learned Linux. Eventually I went to school and learned CS and stuff like that. I don't know, there's more, more to it than that, but I don't know. It was just like I had a little interest. I was playing a game, found an interest, met some like-minded people, and... Uh, that was kind of how I got my start to some extent. So it's not being retained by the serializer though, which is interesting. Oh, it's because probably the serializer takes an IO writer maybe. Who initializes this thing? New record batch serializer. But where's the like IO writer that we're using here? S.reset. Dude, I have to admit that I'm a little bit lost right now. Every programmer starts because they liked games until they found out what game dev is like. Yeah, I've never tried to really make, that's not true, I've made a few little games actually. I made like this, I took a game programming class in college that was super fun. We built this networked racing game. It was 3D, it had a little AI bot, it had graphics, it had physics, it had sounds, and it had net play, which was sweet. You could like connect, and like race around this little track and like shoot each other with weapons physics and stuff like that. That was a five person team. Oh my gosh, that was so fun. But yeah, doing actual professional game development seems really difficult. There's just a lot of like, it's not just playing a physics engine, right? It's like you make the physics engine, that's super fun for a programmer, but then you also have to do all the hard work of making the game actually fun, which is like probably really hard. Um, yeah. So,
So maybe what we should do here is take a look at how we, what accounting we do do. Is that is that going to be maybe a good way to start understanding this stuff? All right, so here's our disk queue. And it actually does have a mem it has something called a disk account, which is different, right? Disk account is not about memory accounting. It's about how much disk space we're using, so we can not use too much disk, but that's not even the, the problem that we have yet. If you're looking at the code that fills the queue, the part writing would empty it, right? Yeah, that's a good point, but I almost feel like we need to be paying attention carefully to the filling part, because that's the part that is going to be using memory, right? Like perhaps, perhaps the idea here is that the partitioned queue is the highest level guy, and it's the one that's keeping track of all the open memory. Um, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Let's go back up real quick up to this partitioned disk queue. It's got something called a disk account, which we don't care about. I'm very lost. I'm very lost here. Like, Okay, let's take a look at maybe the even higher level guy, which is the external sorter. The external sorter should be keeping track somehow. So there's something interesting called max met batch mem size. Like presumably merge memory limit determines the amount of RAM available during the merge operation. This will be roughly a half of the total limit. And is used the used by the dequeued batches in the output batch. So are we in DQ land or are we still in Q land here? If I am a disk queue and I'm owning something called scratch decompressed read bytes. So it's like on the read path, right? Let's take a look at scratch, scratch, decompressed, read bytes. So who writes to this thing exactly? So this is happening when we maybe init deserializer. Okay, so this thing's recursive, fine. And then who's the actual caller? It's something called DQ. DQ is a batch from disk and deserializes it into B. Yo, Primogen Raid. My friend, it's nice to see you again. Welcome everybody to the stream. Y'all are spamming Pokemane emotes and you don't even have them. Is that what's happening right now? I don't even know what to say to that. That's a that's an interesting kind of thing to do. It's an interesting kind of thing to do. Uh, I like the primogen W. That's kind of like a creepy, a creepy half primogen, half Pokemane kind of looking thing. But um, it's good to see all you guys. What's happening, primogen? How was your stream? Did you get up to any? Did you destroy Netflix, or did you take Netflix Netflix to the next level, or did you did you take Vim to the next level? What did you do? What did you do? The other question I have for you. How do you feel about NeoVim? I feel like there's a bunch of NeoVim streamers and we've got you. Are you a NeoVim guy or are you a Vim guy? What's the deal? You know, it's like, when's the, when are the programmer streamers gonna have some Vim drama? <laughs> is what I wanna know. You got your hot tub stream drama on this side of Twitch and you got your NeoVim drama on that side of Twitch. I'll, I'll leave it to you to guess which kind of drama gives more viewers. 
But um, thank you guys all for the follows. And thanks so much for that big raid. 300 people, that's really awesome. Really awesome. If you guys haven't met me, I'm Jordan. I work on CockroachDB on the stream most of the time. Uh, it's a database written in Go. It's a distributed SQL database. Uh, we do, it's kind of multi-region. That's what it's about. You make this database. If you want to have your data living in East Coast, West Coast, Europe, all in one database, shards for you automatically, that's kind of thing. So it's an open source database too. Um, if you hit exclamation point cockroach db in the chat, you can you can see it on GitHub, uh, that kind of thing. But we usually work on this or related projects on the stream. Today we're looking at some memory issues. Love to run into memory issues, always a good time. One, I use NeoVim, used to use Vim. There is somebody currently that is saying I am terrible, causing drama, writing articles about me because of my love for NeoVim, use of control C as escape while only in Vim. Fascinating, that is dramatic, extremely dramatic. Your laptop bag has a Cockroach DB pin in it. Cool product, that is awesome. I am glad to hear that. He made Tim Pope one time cry. Yeah, Tim Pope, man. Tim Pope is a master, a master. He really knows quite a bit about that. He's like the, the Vim plugin creation machine, right? The data bank's too big. Uh, let me let me turn I down these alerts do a little bit here. What's up, Alt F4? It's nice to see you as well. What's it? What's a good way to get into distributed development with Go? There's something called DB Books in the stream. I like to send people these links. If you want to learn more about databases, I think databases are a pretty good way to get into, into distributed systems in general, systems programming and stuff. Pretty fascinating stuff that you can learn about. There's some good links for you there. Yo, thank you so much for that subscription, Alt F4. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support. You are awesome. I'm sure you guys know about Alt f 4s stream. Alta 4, you can tell they've got a stream because, uh, well, it's right in their stream name. So check them out. Give them a follow if you haven't. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to mention that you have a GoLand update available. That's right. Good point. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and hide that hide that notification. It's probably giving you guys some stress. <laughs> but I uh, appreciate that double notif. You know what I mean? Double notif. Um, yeah, so I don't know, you guys. I don't know. It's super rainy here in New York. That's the other thing I just wanted to mention. That's why it's so dark in my room. Ever heard of a rainy, rainy day? That's what's happening today. Yeah, I do use IDEA Vim. Um, thanks for all the follows, you guys. Much appreciated. All right, so let me tell you quickly, just sorry to catch people back up on the stream. Um, what we're working on right now is something in databases called external sort. External sort happens if you're trying to do a big sort of data on disk. Let's say you have a, you know, a big old chunk of table, terabyte of data on disk. And somebody's like, actually, you know what I want you to do? I want you to sort that ta entire table on a column that's not indexed, right? So that's like terabyte of sort, right? And let's say your machine or your cluster of machines doesn't have a terabyte of memory uh, available to spare doing that sort. So here's my question for you guys, those who are interested in databases and distributed systems. How would you think one can do that sort? What do you do if you don't have enough memory to sort an entire terabyte of table data? What do you? How do you make that happen? Because as a database, you've got to do what the user says. That's kind of the thing. You're sort of like a, you're sort of like, just to, you know, the the customer is always right. You know what I mean? So how do you do it? Temp table on the disk, merge sort, split it up. I think those are some pretty good answers. It's definitely, that's the idea, right? You you kind of partition things, you sort individual little partitions one at a time, and then you do a big K-way merge sort of all of those files that you did on, on disk. Um, and so what we're looking at right now, first of all, we're trying to understand the code that does that in Cockroach, which I'm not too familiar with. So it's, it's an interesting time trying to understand in the first place. And we're also looking at potentially a problem. Well, it's more than a potential problem. It's definitely, we have some sort of bug here where we aren't accounting properly for some of the memory that we use when we're slurping that data off of disk. Because um, it's pretty sensitive, right? You got to make sure that you're partitioning things nicely enough so that you don't have to use all the memory that you would need otherwise. But at the same time, when you, when you pull that data back into memory, you have to make sure that that temporary memory isn't enough to overwhelm your machine as well, right? So it's this little dance, and there's something wrong with our dance. <laughs> there's something wrong with our dance. In this particular example, 
what we can see is that we explode the machine in certain circumstances, especially when we have really wide rows. So rows that individually are large, larger, large, several hundred kilobytes, something like that. So, so we're kind of looking at, there's this tool that we've been playing around with called ViewCore, um, which is pretty neat. Um, ViewCore is a tool that's part of, of, uh, of the Go X debug library that's been a little bit broken, but we've been working on it, improving it a little bit on the stream. Oh, you guys don't like the white background. Sorry about that. Um, it's, it's like a core dump analyzer. So what that does is it takes a, you know, a dump of all of the memory in a program that happens to be written out to disk, which you can ask the computer to do if it crashes a program and it slurps all that stuff back into memory and it figures out the, the links between all the objects and stuff like that. And using that, you can actually find quite a bit pretty quickly about what's going wrong in a program. Um, so that's, that's been a tool that we've been improving and it's been really helpful for debugging some of these, uh, memory issues. Does the view core changes be merged back into Xdebug? I'm very much hopeful that the answer is yes. Like I was saying, I was chatting with some people on the Go team and they are interested in accepting those patches. Um, the question is, can I nerd snipe them quickly enough to get them uh, get them interested in reviewing my patches? That's That remains to be seen, but I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful about it. Yes, I use Goland and IdeaVim. Um, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not, don't have enough internal brain memory to keep this giant project cockroach db in my head enough to use ordinary vim without ide support but that's just me um all right so so um, unfortunately i'm gonna have to show you the white screen so apologies for that in advance but here's what we're looking at this is a in memory object a disk queue which is again what we use to represent um, one of these partitions that we're slurping back up into memory. And I think that the issue that we're looking at right now, so we've got this scratch decompressed read bytes field here. If you click into it, it's like a giant byte size. Like how many bytes is this? It's uh, 200, 200,000, 134 megabyte. This is a 134 megabyte byte size. Like that's a big, big old byte slice. I think it's it's actually not good that it's so big at all. And I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out why it got so big in the first place. Um, that's that's the plan here. Hey, Yahor, hello, Yahor. It's good to see you, my friend, on the stream. It's good to see you on the stream. We're looking at some fun stuff. 1,024 is size of a batch with large rows. That does sound just about right. It's like we don't have a byte limit for this thing. We're only using a batch limit. That sounds pretty likely. Not being so familiar with this code, I was poking around searching for where we're accounting for all that memory. And I don't think we do actually account for memory in this disk queue thing, as far as I can tell. It kind of feels like we we don't do that at all, but I'm not, not exactly sure. Um, So I don't, yeah, I wonder, I kind of want to go and search back for where we do this in queue thing. And let's take a look maybe at, depends on who the user of the disk queue is. So we are looking at this external sort. That's kind of what we're checking out right now. Um, and I guess, I just wanted to see like, is it this that we're gonna do? External sorter and queue. Kind of feels like, yeah, so maybe maybe this is the idea here. When you have, here's our external sorter operator. Every time we ask it to get a next batch, we, and we're doing new partition state. Man, I don't know how this stuff works at all. External sorter new partition indicates that the next batch we read should start a new partition. Zero length batch indicates that the input to the external sort has been fully consumed and we should proceed to merging. So it kind of feels like what we want to do is when we're in this merging state, we want to see what happens, right? We don't account for the compressed byte slice, but the user of the disk queue is supposed to account once the slice is converted into a batch. So I think the fun problem here is that our compressed byte slice or our decompressed byte slice 
is 134 megabytes per queue. <laughs> and we have like a bunch of concurrent queues. So it kind of feels like we need to figure out a way to account for this, this big boy. This thing is, uh, this thing is not a joke. So this was, this was, uh, yeah, we definitely don't account for this. I think I can update, I can update the project. We'll say commands, edit project, um, taking a look inside of the external sort algorithm for cockroach DB. So yeah, this was, uh, this was, this issue was found thanks to M Lazowick, who has been a prolific hanger outer on the stream and a user as well. So thanks to him, but it's very easy repro. All you have to do is make a big, a wide row table, very wide, I guess, but you know, that's allowable and do a big sort over it. And then you can uh, crash things once it spills to disk. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I wonder if the idea here is that we could use So this is actually something that I'm not too familiar with. I guess what we can do now with these allocators is not just do regular operations that add more vectors, but we can also just manually adjust the memory. Yeah, even with concurrency one, crazy, right? You just run a command on an otherwise idle node and you can uh, explode everything to death. Very simple use case here. Very, It should be a very simple case for us to look at um, uh, in terms of uh, knowing why we should be fixing it. <laughs> I was I was talking earlier on the stream about how I would love to have a goal of having high concurrency TPCH never fail. But uh, what about concurrency one wide external sort never failing? That's that's another goal that would be good to have, I think. But out of curiosity, like, oh, wow. So we use this all over the place, I guess. Let's say we are a spilling queue, which is, I think, the theoretical idea here. So this, I think, actually, we can take a look here. DQ returns the next batch from the queue, which is valid only until the next call to DQ. And I, I do think that's probably what's going on. I think we could actually look at the stacks here. What is the stack? So one other cool thing about this view core viewer is if I go all the way back up to the top of the page here, I can look at go routines. And I think, in theory, I could be looking for the go routine that has the currently running stuff in it, right? I don't know. Hmm, maybe that's going to be a little difficult. Maybe it's in this one. So here I am, right? Um, I have external sorter. I have ordered synchronizer. I have perform operation. So I'm in something called disk spiller base. If you fix accounting, will that mean some of that memory will be freed or only change from crashing to hitting SQL memory limit? I think what's happening right now is that those excess scratch bytes aren't getting counted against memory limit at all. We're just ignoring them. Um, and I think the, the ideal fix, well, I'm not sure what the ideal fix would be, but it seems to me like we would probably have to use smaller partitions, possibly smaller and more partitions. It kind of feels like what we're not doing is noticing the correct partition size based on the wideness of a row. That, that's kind of how it feels to me. It's like when we're in queuing these batches, we need to make the batches smaller based on their byte size. And I think that would possibly fix the issue. External sort doesn't use spilling queue. It does. I think it does kind of assume small rows. I think you're right about that. It's just we don't account for this. We sort of assume that the scratch memory is trivial enough to ignore is kind of what it's about. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm using the wrong, I'm not, I shouldn't be looking inside of spilling queue is what you're saying. I would like to look again at when we actually start so in sorter finish, sorter remitting, final merging, repeated merging, spill partition, and new partition. Spill partition indicates that the next batch we read should be added to the last partition so far. A zero length batch. 
I just want to see where we start like writing stuff. It's got to be this thing, right? In Q. So if b dot length is greater than zero, batch mem size is equal to call mem dot get batch mem size. And then we add to the total size of the partitions info plus equals batch mem size. I see, but we never split up the batches. It almost feels like um, um, at this moment, if if our batch's memory size exceeds some, I don't know, some maximum, we should split the batch up and later use this maximum as the accounted for minimum of each each partition or something like that, right? Because the idea here would be that like, let's say we, we could guarantee that each partition would use at most 64 megabytes, then you could account for 64 megabytes when you create a partition. And then some other system would know you can't use more partitions at the same time than that sum or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. External sorter uses disk queue directly. It's not n squared, but it's O of n log n, keeps all the scratches from all merges. Yeah, I do think it's kind of like a log n kind of situation, right? Because the number of partitions is presumably logarithmic in the total size of the something. Sure, there's a to do about it somewhere. <laughs> that makes sense. So let's take a look. Here's an interesting part of the algorithm, right? So should merge some partitions returns true if we need to merge some current partitions into one before dispelling a new partition. Expected merge memory usage. Now we check whether we're likely to exceed the memory limit for the merge operation. Each of the partitions will need to use a single batch at a time. Yes. So we count that usage based on the maximum batch mem size of each partition. Do you think it's possible that we're miscalculating this thing? And what is merge memory limit? Who sets merge memory limit? This thing is set to memory limit divided by two. A memory limit is set to max number of partitions times disk queue config dot buffer size bytes. Okay, this is interesting, right? Because this seems like pretty nice, actually. And so who's setting this buffer size bytes exactly? There's two cache modes default cache mode and reuse cache mode. So it's either 128 kilobytes or 64 kilobytes. I see. Well, if it's 100, if it's 64 kilobytes, then our batch sizes, and, and we, we would have to write at least one row, right? So if, if we had to write at least one row, but our row was bigger than 128 kilobytes, then like we would essentially write one row per partition and nothing might work. Like imagine in the in the limit that we had to fill, we, we couldn't make a partition that was bigger than a single row at a time. Would we be just completely sunk at that point? Like, I feel like you're pretty, pretty, you're in bad trouble if, if things come to that. recursively merging those partitions. Mm. All right, so what if I see, should merge some partitions returns true if the expected memory usage exceeds the merge memory limit. So the question is maybe next, how do we calculate this max batch mem size thing? We set it equal to the batch mem size. So actually that's a little bit confusing because you'd think that this would actually work properly in that case. Because um, it does seem like we're, we're taking care of properly keeping a track of the maximum batch memory size of a given partition, right? So 
I guess I would sort of expect. Was that a minus equals not an equals? I'm not sure which you're which you're talking about there, unfortunately, but it's quite possible. I think we could we could probably figure out a little bit more about what's going on here by looking at this object viewer, right? Like, so let, let's take a look. We should be able to see somewhere partitions info dot max batch mem size. So here's an array full of our max batch mem size, and here's what it's got. There's two elements in it. One is size 448, 316 kilobytes. No, 300, yeah, 317 kilobytes, 10 megabytes, and then 150 megabytes. <laughs> so it knows that there's a 150 megabyte batch. <laughs> I mean, in a certain extent, I feel like the problem that we're actually having here is that we do not handle giant rows well and uh that's like a separate it, it's like a systemic issue it's a systemic issue and i i guess i would maybe recommend to m lazowick that you maybe try to reconsider storing that big of well is it even that big though that's the thing it's it's kind of like what did we say it was again We said it was, um, hmm. well, I can't find, uh, I can't find it anymore. 128, 128 kilobyte rows. I guess it doesn't, doesn't sound that big until it becomes big is basically how it works. Um, you can't spill the memory requires for spilling. Yeah. I mean, you have to get it perfectly right. Once you're starting to do, once you're starting to do, yeah. So 150 megabytes kind of makes sense, right? Cause if you multiply 128 kilobytes by a thousand, you get about 128 megabytes, 128 megabytes for batch size. And this is 150. I don't know. There's some slop or like, cause we have some UUIDs there and stuff like that. Maybe, maybe I didn't quite size it properly, but you know, it's approximately the same. And even even if it was exactly 128 megabytes, it would be, it'd be a bit big. Um, and so in the end, what, what we saw, like, let's go back to ViewCore for a second. What we saw, if I do histogram top 20, we see nine 150 megabyte batches in memory, nine 134 megabyte batches in memory, nine 134 megabyte, another nine of different kinds of batch in memory. And then like some other miscellaneous stuff. And so it feels like there's something missing. Like we shouldn't have, we shouldn't be keeping so many in memory is kind of how it feels. It's like, we know that two of them, two of them is enough to be more than that some minimum. So we should like stop merging in size two. We should have limited the size of those batches by 64 megabytes in C fetcher. Yeah, I don't know quite what to say about that. Yeah, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? Isn't it? So let's go back into this, this guy, our scratch decompressed read bytes. This thing is like, But anyway, even the module external sort equals two and run the query. Okay, yeah, that sounds fun. Let's do it. So let's uh, let's keep the core open. We'll we'll run. Um, start this. Hold on. Let's. I feel like that music is bad. All right. Um, we're gonna say. SSH to our machine again, except let's not use these port forwards. We're going to tail F 
um, logs, cockroach.log. We're gonna cockroach, uh, cockroach SQL insecure. And then we're gonna run our query, except no, we have to do our, uh, we have to say select CRDB internal dot set V module. All right. So let's execute this thing and watch everything explode. So external sorter is merging partitions. Oh my gosh, this logging is so good. Good call. External sorting is merging partitions of partition indexes zero and one with sizes 143 megabytes, 143 megabytes. Um, and then it kind of keeps repeating that same thing. And then at a certain point, it'll presumably die altogether. Um, my machine is now very sad and possibly going to die. Oh yeah, left partitions growing, huh? But I don't think we have to keep all of that in memory, do we? Let's take a look at that log line. Is merging. I mean, it... let's just, I think we're just going to, I think this machine is getting unhappy. So I'm just going to terminate, terminate it before it, uh, makes the machine unusable. Okay. So again, taking a look at our log now, we basically see nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, what I find it a little bit interesting is that, uh, I mean, I still don't quite know how this stuff works, but it seems like it doesn't, it wouldn't want to have all nine in memory at the same time or whatever. Like perhaps there's some issue with it, not re removing references to itself or something over time. Could there be something like that as a problem? Like, do we ever clear that thing out? Scratch. This guy, do we ever nil this thing? Uh, do we just zero it? Do we just not, do we just never clear it? Could that be uh, an obvious problem or what? Oh wait, no, this is not the same scratch. Sorry. Scratch bytes, scratch, decompress, read bytes. We do seem to clear it, huh? Yeah, my bad. It was the wrong file altogether. Incorrect. Looking at a terribly wrong thing. So when we type in Q, if the B dot, it does seem like we're doing it too late, right? Shouldn't we do it right as soon as we finish Decompress bytes. I mean, it seems like in this case, we should say, what is going on here? Snappy compressed block versus uncompressed block. So, I mean, uh, we we got to file deserializer and then the question is when do we like finish deserializing this stuff right like when it, when is it safe to throw away these bytes it feels like we don't throw them away and that has got to be part of the issue right maybe in a deserializer so we say data to read if data to read error is not equal to null return false error if it's not data read we're done otherwise we say deserializer state dot get batch 
I see. And so as soon as we're done with this, this is the moment at which we should be able to say, clear, clear me. Like at this moment, like at, at this moment, we're ready to clear our scratch bites. Right? I mean, it, to me, it almost feels like we fills in the given in mem batch with the requested on this data batch IDX. This is our in memory batch. Here's our requested on disk and record batches is they have file blocks inside. And what is a file block? It's got an offset, a metadata length and a body length. So are these blocks, are there multiple blocks per scratch data or whatever? Or what, you know, it's, it's a bit confusing. It's a bit confusing. Deserializer state cur batch. So if we've already done our file, if we've already made one, we're good to go. I don't fully understand this, to be honest, but it, it does feel like we're missing a step of clearing out that those decompressed bytes. I'm fairly. And why do we, I, I really don't understand why we keep them around, right? We get these decompressed bytes and we just don't, why, why do we keep this? Like, I don't get this. Why do we keep this? Is it, is it to save on allocations? It's probably to save on allocations. We just weren't thinking properly. Like we need to be allocating here and then throwing it away. That's that's key. Okay. That's key. Snappy.decode, does this thing... Yeah, I mean, honestly, like why do we even... I mean, honestly, like check this out. Let's delete scratch decompress read bytes because if we're doing external sort, we don't care about doing these allocations, right? We have to be doing these allocations. I don't know. Why do we have this? I don't I don't get this. I actually don't get this. Why don't we just say I mean this could be completely wrong. So don't This is just an experiment, right? We're just going to say We're just going to say Oh, I see. I see. So there is something a little bit confusing, which is that there seems to be some state, right? So basically, I can't do that. I can't do that altogether because check this out. Back over here, if block type is equal to snappy compressed block, then we we go and actually decode from our scratch decompressed read bytes, which we've already written into, which is confusing. You know what I mean? Like, so where are we writing to this place in the first place? It's uh, it's it's a bit confusing. It's a bit stateful. It's a bit stateful. It's as if we're saying in this moment, in this moment, we, we make a fresh allocation if we don't have enough space and then we copy from the compressed byte slice that we just got from this writer thing into our scratch bytes and then we deserialize it little by little is that what's going on dude i don't i honestly am confused this music is something called lo-fi non-copyright hip-hop beats to stream to <laughs> How about that for a super janky sounding playlist? I feel like it's a little loud, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Funny. You gotta you gotta skirt those uh D, D, those DMCA goblins when playing music on stream, right guys? Y'all know. Y'all know how it is. Okay, that being said, still pretty confused about this. Because I mean, it's got to be that when we use this call CRD file deserializer from bytes, 
No, that does not make any sense, you guys. I, I think that there's something missing from my understanding still, because I think we would have to be rewriting to this thing. And I guess we do it over here. In DQ, maybe. I mean, we're writing to this thing all the time. I, I don't. So we, we write to it once a couple of times in maybe in it deserializer. Fine. And then we write to it also in this other in DQ. So DQ, DQ is a batch from disk, deserialize it into B. The very first thing that we do. Yo, what is this cache mode? What is this cache mode? Please explain what this cache mode is about. Who sets this thing? Oh, it depends on the type of, it depends on the type of thing, I see. So if I were to go to my external sort, we're always using something called disk queue cache mode, reuse cache. The cache mode is re chosen to reuse the cache to have a smaller cache per partition without affecting performance. This cache mode reuse cache imposes a limitation that all in queues happen before all dequeues to be able to reuse memory. In this mode, the cache will be divided as follows, one half for buffered writes and buffered reads, and one half for compressed writes and compressed reads. Okay, well, well, in that case, in that case, uh, do I know anything? No. Do I know anything? No, we're in reuse cache mode. And the default for reuse cache mode is the smaller one, 64 kilobytes. All right. So jumping back then to what we were looking at. So we never go into this thing because we are in cache mode default. No, we're not in cache mode default. We're in cache mode reuse cache. So we do go into this thing. This is the first DQ after enqueues. So reuse the right cache for reads. Note that the buffer for compressed reads is reused, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so come back over here for a second. What is our state that we're in right now? What is our state that we're in right now? Here's our stack. Should we be able to know our state right now of our external sorter? Where's our little state variable? State, external sorter state is two. Okay, so if I go to external sorter state, zero, one, two, it, we're in repeated merging. It, this is a cockroach DB stuff, M Vargas. Okay, so repeated merging indicates that we need to merge maximum partitions into one and spill that new partition to disk. The theme. Here's another question that I've got an answer for for you, my friend. Write in a command. Check that out. That's called, we anticipated that question and added it to the FAQ. Luge Aiden. The theme question. <laughs> brutal, brutal. Super brutal. Okay, so external sort of repeated merging. We do a bunch of stuff, create merger for partition, we init. We enqueue a bunch of times. So we're still in our enqueue land. We're in enqueue land at this moment. We have not begun to dequeue yet, I believe. I posit that we have not dequeued anything yet. Maybe. Okay, so given the fact that we're in queuing, that means we are down, wait, where were we? We were in, but what about that? I'm confused then. If we're still in queuing, then why are we even touching that crazy, uh, hmm. Hmm. Why are we touching that scratch memory dequeuer thing is my question. Why are we touching stretch, scratch decompressed read bytes if we're still in in queue mode, right? 
We're still in NQ mode. Or it's probably this recursive thing that I'm just confused about. It's probably we're, we're spending some time DQing, some time in queuing, but they're happening in different queues or something like that. Jeez Louise. Okay, coming back over here one more time. This is in DQ. So we're absolutely 100% sure that we're doing a mix of both. It's just probably, presumably, this particular disk queue is only doing DQing. That's, that's what's going on. All right, so maybe... Maybe the issue here then, I, I, I'm actually, I'm still confused about whether the issue here is that we're, this memory is unaccounted for properly or we're not clearing it properly. I can't tell. I can't tell. I just cannot tell. This is the first DQ after NQ, so reuse the write cache for reads. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I think I, I understand. Okay, okay. So what's actually happening here possibly is that this call is possibly suspicious, is it not? Because who's limiting the number of active disk queues that we have at the same time? Could, could that be the issue? That we're not limiting the number of active disk queues at the, at we have i think we do do that though right isn't that what that max partition size thing is all about right here's partitioned queue max num partitions is supposed to know about this stuff but perhaps Max number of partitions. Determines the maximum number of active partitions we can have at once. Limited by the number of file descriptors available is dynamically computed limit when the memory usage of the merge exceeds something. So max number of partitions here has some like default or something, but presumably that's not gonna be the, this can't be like a statically calculated thing, can it? Or can it? Oh, it's like a, it's a closure. The min partitions is three. <laughs> okay, cool. So it, it's a, cons oh, interesting. So this is actually a fancy little guy. So if I go to new external sorter, then what I'm going to see is this is a function. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> okay, I'm still confused. I'm still not quite getting it. Create disks back sort. There should be one that is literally just for the external sorter, right? This one's for windowers. This one is for sorters. Okay, so here we have the max number is zero. Okay, <laughs> so the max number is zero. Great, 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 great. That means that we have no maximum and we presumably we calculate it later. So let's follow that again. Let's follow that again. Max number of partitions. If it's zero, uh, what's this about? With the default limit of 256 file descriptors, this results in 16 partitions. This is a hard maximum of partitions that will be used by the external sorter. So we set this number to possibly, we can actually see over here, can't we? In our in our external sorter there should be some sort of max number of partitions is set to three though it's set to three isn't it and it's been dynamically reduced oh boy okay so this is very interesting where do we set this to true It almost feels as if Okay, I'm st still confused. 
I'm still confused, but I'm starting to understand that there's something clearly a little bit wrong here, which is that even though we have a max number of partitions set to three, we have many partitions resident in memory. We have many partitions resident in memory, despite the fact that we're supposed to only have three partitions mem resident in memory. Is that not suspicious to us? Take a look at partitioner. Partitioner dot partitions has 17. It's got 32 things, possibly 16 of them. Yo, Brahanster, what is popping, my friend? Welcome in. By the way, in case you guys were curious, the rain has stopped and the birds are chirping. How about that? Might be forgetting to close fully processed partitions. That seems possible. That seems possible. Seems very possible. So let's let's see if we can understand what could be going on there. Let's see if we understand. Let's go over into our DQ. Aha, uh -huh. so if batch.length is equal to zero, queue is finished, release the acquired file descriptor, close read partition. What does close read partition do? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't nil the partition. It says, oh, maybe it does. It says close read on our disk queue, but that doesn't close any of them. It kind of seems like we're missing to close the actual partition memory as well. Like what if we were to say right here, wait a minute. What? So inside of partitions, I have something called a partition and a partition has a queue. Okay. Wait, that's a little bit confusing, but it does have a disk queue and the disk queue has all of this excess state. So I think that's gotta be the issue, right? Like what if I were to say, enhance my close read. Um, inside of my disk queue to do more stuff. Like what, what if I were to say d dot uh, scratch equals nil? What if I were to say this? <laughs> what if I were to say simply this? Can we try it? I'm gonna try it. Wouldn't that be a nice fix? What do we send M. Laswick for this discovery, by the way? <laughs> Gotta send him some swag. Unofficial bug bounty program sponsored by large data bank. Find a bug, get some swag. Okay. Uh, let's put this thing up here. We've been fixing a lot of bugs related to memory M. Lazowick with one liners lately. Did you see, I think you must have seen this last one that we fixed with basically a, a one liner. Check this one out. Check this one out. You see this? This is what we call a one liner, more or less. It's a it's like a three liner with some some comments. But it's basically a one liner. And uh it, it's a similar issue. I think what we have a problem with is kind of like remembering to close things in situations where we aren't quite done. We think that we're going to be done later. And at some point, the memory will be freed, right? So it's not like a memory leak that you usually think of in school where it's like, oh, this is permanently leaked memory. It's like leaked for a little bit until the end of the query. But that's just as bad for a database uh, because the query can be arbitrarily long. Okay, so let's go ahead and run. Let's not get too excited. Like, what if this doesn't fix it, right? It, it very well might not. So we're going to run. Uh, we're going to do our start. We're going to do our SQL. We're going to do our prepare. We're going to do our execute. Then we can go ahead and go to our website where we look at the allocated memory, which is over here. We should have looked at the, the logger. This isn't looking promising. Not. Well, it's looking, it's looking a bit better because it can at least garbage collect stuff. 
but it still shouldn't be using so much memory maybe i feel like we're in trouble we're gonna die well what do you guys think are we are we dead or are we not dead <laughs> could do a prediction oh i should have done a prediction i should have done a prediction before we did that that would have been really good drive that chat engagement it's a little bit too late though because we're dead okay so that's fine i think the next step for us to do after this is try again with the the, the more logging so we're gonna we're gonna go like this again we're gonna go back over here um we're going to set our v module we're gonna prepare we're gonna execute okay then we're going to tail our logs here and maybe we won't really get any interesting new information here at all this is kind of the same log that we got last time you can still drive chat engagement by killing the database so you can spam F. <laughs> that would be pretty funny, actually. I need I need like a little a little sound effect. Um, I can be like, <laughs> I don't, do you guys watch? Um, there's this chess channel I sometimes watch called Chess Bras, um, and they have this pretty funny. Uh, they have a pretty funny sound effect that they do when they beat somebody it's like a ko sound effect and everybody spams the ko emoji i love it it's good stuff okay so it, look at what it says i mean we're, we're doing better right we're saying like external sorter is merging partitions with partition we got like way further down and then it says external sorter consumed input external sorter is closed so did we just get lucky then and we finished this time but it was just lucky it kind of seems like we got we got lucky this time and it, and it worked all right which is fascinating um, but it still seems like we're using too much memory, right? Like, um, so I think if I were to run select star, let's, let's run a smaller query that doesn't use as much memory. We'll say select T from T order by T desk. So this is going to, whoops. Did that just, what? I feel like, I feel like something is, something is broken. <laughs> something is broken. <laughs> Maybe what I did was not enough here. What if, okay, is there other memory that we hold on to in this partition queue? That's a big F. What's a good F sound sound effect? Um, what's a good F sound effect? What's like a meme car crash sound? Does anybody know? Is there like a good meme, meme soundtrack that we can use for this kind of thing? The price is right fail sound. Wait, did I not write fail sound in there? <laughs> this is a pretty good one. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. Microsoft Sam saying F. They say a man should always oh, dress no. for the job. Please no. If I get DMCA'd by freecreditreport.com. <laughs> I'll know who to talk to. Okay, so here's what we're going to do now. We're going to do another run, but we're going to capture a, a core dump again because I feel like that's that was that's been good so far. That's been good to us. So we're going to run um close this thing. Oh wait, we need we need to have this start command. Okay. So terminal what are, where are we? Where are we? I'm so confused. I'm lost. This is terminal 2. We need terminal 1 to be our main port forward terminal. So this is going to stay open to the box. Over here, we're going to have our thing that starts the database. And this last one is going to be, we're also going to be connected to it. And it's going to be the one that can run the query. You know what we should do is we could run, hmm. We just like construct it here. So we can say Rushpred run Jordan test one. Uh, nah, I think we just need a fourth window. The answer is simple. Make another window. Okay.
Roblox death sound, the oof sound, that's a good one. Everybody loves the, the good Roblox oof sound these days. Okay, so we're gonna run Cockroach SQL insecure. We're gonna do our prepare X. We're gonna do our execute X, but before we're doing that, we're gonna get ready to kill this thing with a seg fault so that we can collect a core dump. So we'll run this. Let's go over back over here. We'll watch our stats viz. Wait until it's nice and big. But not too big, probably. Maybe now is good. We're going to say kill all sig seg v cockroach. OK, so then we should hopefully get a core getting dumped here. The Wilhelm scream. <laughs> That's a good one, too. Wilhelm scream. I like that. <laughs> Did you guys ever program in HyperCard? So another thing, somebody was asking me how I got into programming. Another thing that I did as an early programmer was use HyperCard. And there was like a Wilhelm scream sound effect that was like in HyperCard by default, I think. So if you could, you could like program a little game with it and then uh, use the Wilhelm scream for that. I thought that was pretty funny. All right, so here I'm gonna do view core, mount data one cores, 15488, exe cockroach. Imagine if you had a Wilhelm scream on Segfault, dude. That'd be so good. That'd be so good. I just need a little hotkey for it. <laughs> Register the signal handle on all your programs. Yeah, I think that's good. I just need a little button. I need like, you know how some people have like the, the easy button or whatever? I need like a Wilhelm scream button. Okay, so we're going to do HTML. Well, first let's do a histo top 20 to get the top 20 big slices. And then at that same time, we can go to our localhost 8080. So we've just, we've got the same kind of effect, you guys. It's not any different, really. We've got the same ones, and I think these are still being retained by the compressed whatever. So if I say peak this thing, what I should see, well, I guess I can go it this way as well. Disk queue, click our disk queue, click our object. This is going to take some time to load. It's got to do those reverse paths, which always takes a little bit of time. Our disk queue writers has a compressed buff. This is different. This is something that we're not clearing either. Perhaps now we've cleared half of the things and we need to also clear this. Ah, so it's str scratch decompressed read bytes is now empty actually, which is fascinating. So this thing is disk queue and perhaps they're all empty now and we just have to clear that other bit of state. Yeah, look at that. Okay, all right. So we, we're, we're on the right track, I think. I think what we need to do is say like, um, we've got this writer and this th this guy has to be closed. We're not closing this, this writer thing, which is not great. Um, so we've got to close this writer too. This struct size introspector is insane, dude. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's like completely next level. It's completely next level. Uh, I, it's 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 completely next level. Like I didn't make most of this, right? This is just the tool that Keith Randall made that has been broken for a long time and. I feel it needs to be marketed and promoted because it is just that incredible. And it doesn't just let you do struct size, right? It lets you do these analyses. That pprof thing, I think I showed you the pprof thing last time. I actually, I got in contact with some of the Go people um, to get this stuff merged. And I, I think they're interested in it. Um, it's just a matter of bandwidth. Everybody's got bandwidth constraints. Their roadmaps are always tight. Every, every, everybody, as soon as you're making a big important project, you're gonna have a roadmap to contend with I think that's what we're dealing with here. So that being said, where is that thing where we're nilling out the guy that we can do better on now? Inside of close read, like look how easy this was. It's just incredibly easy compared to how it was before we had this kind of tool. Before we have this kind of tool, this is like an endless painful cycle of, of death, of debugging. The heat profiler is not great. It's like, you're just so confused. And so now I think all I have to do is say disk, where's my writer? I think I need to make like a close, a close thing, right? Like this thing. So let's look at compressed buff. 
Who closes this thing? When does this happen? Clear and reuse cash. I just feel like we, we should just nil this thing, right? Like, aren't we done? Aren't we done? Once we do close read, what is the contract of close read exactly? Close read closes the read, the red file descriptor. So here's a question. If you're here, still here, you're horror. Once we do close read, are we, are we, can we reuse the queue? And do we want to be reusing this cache or whatever? Or not so much? Like once we do this, are we just done with it forever? Null bitmap. Oh my God. Can't leave that alert off. Null bitmap. Thanks so much for the 13 months of support. Nice to see you again. Um, not familiar with the code. Well, that's okay. We'll get all familiar together. I think I'm guessing that the idea here, Q is finished. Release the acquired file descriptor. To me, this seems like we're completely done with it, right? <laughs> You're most familiar in the company. Well, look, sometimes you got to just, sometimes you got to just like, uh, I don't know. I don't even know what to say. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to go wild. We're just going to, we're just going to, we're just going to go wild. We're just going to edit this entire thing to be empty and see if everything breaks. And if it doesn't, then we should have been doing this a long time ago, right? This seems legit. We're going to try it out. Okay. I still don't have a terminal that's available to upload stuff. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll upload this thing. Null bitmap question for you. A lot of the audience sometimes asks, how do I learn more about distributed databases and systems concepts? I think that you've written some pretty good posts recently about some concepts. And I'm wondering if you would link them for the chat because people are always asking, how do I learn more about this stuff? What is it? What is MVCC? What is MVCC? How does it work? What's garbage collection about? So the answer is to work at Cockroach Labs and ask questions to Ben Darnell. There's another answer, I think, which is to read Null Bitmap's blog, but I'm not so sure if Null Bitmap wants to be outed, so I won't out them. But Null Bitmap's got a sick blog, dude. Sick blog. Okay, let me... um. Let me try this one more time. Let me try this one more time. So we're going to we're going to go back over here. We're going to click start. Doxed. OK, Null has self doxed. But you guys check these posts out. Yeah, you see that JKIV JKIV is like, how do I learn about systems? And the answer is that you read the posts on that website. There's some good stuff there. Some really good stuff. OK, so we're going to run. Cocker SQL insecure. We're going to run prepare. We're going to run execute. And we're going to go to our stats viz and see what happens. This says to me that the that we've like made a bug in the code and it exploded. Okay. So that was not the right solution. <laughs> that was not the right solution. I had a feeling that was a bit of a YOLO move here. So let's take a look at what kind of breakage we've introduced. I probably should have just run the unit test after I made that change, huh? So the complaint is that when we run close, we've, wait, what, 457? 457? Oh, so disk queue, oh, there's a difference between, oh, what? Wait, what? Possible better answers to read Martin Clevin's book. I think I've got that one in my DB books, right? Yeah, dude. Um, so here's a question. Check this. When we run close, we theoretically, we theoretically, do we, do we delete our writer? So does, do people ever just call close read on its own or is that not a thing? Do people ever call close read on its own? Close current file. 
Okay, so this is not valid, I guess. Man, I don't understand this stuff even a little bit. Not gonna lie. Rewind, close read. Ah, I see. So it's like, close read is this thing where we we sort of want to reuse some of this stuff, I guess. I don't know. So what should close read do? Should it close the read? Hmm. So here's another question I have actually. Inside of the normal close, do we even clear out? Okay, so part of the problem is that even, like let's say we were properly using close and not close read. Maybe like the solution is really that I shouldn't be messing with over things over here. When we call close, it closes any resources associated with the queue. Like that sounds good, right? Like who who, who calls this and when? Are we call, calling this at reasonable times or not really? We have something called close inactive read partitions, which seems cool. And that happens at times at random. Who knows where this is? Maybe this is the issue. Maybe I, I really ought to be actually just messing with the close method and that would be good enough. Maybe the life cycle is already set up and we just haven't we just haven't uh, completely cleared things. See, this is like a typical thing that we sometimes do is we like close individual elements, but then I don't know why you wouldn't want to just be like, you know, D equals disk Q or whatever, like I was looking at before. Perhaps this will like cause other issues, but I feel like it shouldn't. Okay, we're going to try this again. Let's try this again. We'll try this again. Want to change something in external sort? I'm stubborn. I'm stubborn, and I'm hoping that merely fixing this close method will solve all of our problems. But you're probably right. It remains to be seen. That J32, dude. Oh, yeah. We got a big boy machine. Big boy machine. Text file busy. Okay, we have to kill all cockroach. I'm going to open the, the window in here because it's gotten a bit hot again. All righty. So let's uh, let's try again. Let's try again. We need to start. Okay. So uh, what's happening now to our memory? Oh my gosh! Look at this. I should have done a prediction, but look at this. This is this is better. You see this? This is like good shit right here. This is called memory usage is even. We're properly doing good things. And I guess the next question is going to be, are we going to return a correct result? But this is this is definitely a pog moment right here. Go us. Go us. Children, yay. We need a children, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy. Okay, this is this is fantastic. It was a simple matter of not closing out our temporary memory. Let's see if the program finishes. That's the next question. The program finished. It finished in 50 seconds. What happens if we run this as an explain analyze? I used to have these, I, ha I used to have a little soundboard, you guys, back when I was streaming from the Mac. It was pretty sweet, but um, I got rid of it when I switched to Windows. I need to, I need to regenerate the soundboard. I got to get the children's yay. I've got to get the Wilhelm scream. I've got to, I've got to spruce it up a little bit. Using 100% of your memory means you get your money's worth. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. If you don't use 100%, you're in bad trouble. You're in bad trouble. You need to be taking it to the limit, you know? We used to have this issue in Cockroach, which is called, why doesn't Cockroach use all available resources to make every query as fast as possible? <laughs> oh, the sound effects are a little bit loud. Sorry about that. I got to work on that then. So here we now have a thing that says, the data bank's too big. what? I have to narrow down the search. How are you going to do that? 
by guessing. Oops. It says max memory allocated 660 megabytes. Max equal temp disk memory 175 megabytes. Well, I feel like this is a pretty decent outcome. So let's see. Uh, why did you switch to Windows? It's mainly because I built a PC that was really fast and I didn't want to do Linux stuff because I just, I don't know. I've done Linux stuff in my past, didn't want to do it again. Wanted to try Windows, people say good things. And it's actually, it's actually great. I really like Windows given the fact that it has WSL2, which is very excellent as a concept. Every time the infrastructure team informs me that I've maxed out a server CPU, I tell them that they're welcome. <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and what are we going to do? We're going to make the world's smallest fix commit ever. Little one liner. So how do we how do we test this, though? Here's a question. Does anybody have a great idea? <laughs> I already had this Bitcoin mining rig and I realized I could use it for programming. Um. Actually, it's uh, it's Chia mining null bitmap. Bitcoin mining, you can only use it with ASICs these days. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, does anybody know how that, let's see, network bandwidth cryptocurrency. This is like, I'm so afraid of this. This is like the worst concept of all time. Packet.cash. It's a bandwidth hard blockchain that encourages you to waste internet bandwidth to get money. Is there a graph of the network bandwidth used over time? I would love to see that. It doesn't really seem like there is. Anyway, this thing needs to die, dude. It's so sketchy. It's like the worst idea ever. The SSD one. Yeah, that's Chia. Chia is really scary. Like Chia disk usage over time. Uh, where's the charts? Net space. How do I see this like, man? Where's the thing that's like, how much, how many terabytes are used by Chia? How many exabytes are used by Chia? How do I get this graph? <laughs> Why? Anyway, it's terrible. It's basically like the worst thing ever. Um, total waste of resources. Yes, it destroys SSDs. That's another funny thing about it is that a bunch of Places have banned Chia. Ban Chia. No, this is not going to be good enough. Um, hosting provider banned Chia. Hetzner banned Chia. And then there's this other one that banned it just the other day, I thought. Anyway, you guys, don't do it. Don't do it to yourselves. Stay out. Stay out. NFTs went to zero. Chia is going to go to zero eventually, I hope. Did you guys ever read? Okay, here's another. I'll stop talking about cryptocurrency in just a second. It's just, it really gets on my nerves that it exists. Have you ever read the Zones of Thought trilogy? Fire, what's it called? Uh, Zones of Thought trilogy. Fire Upon the Deep. Have you read this? Werner Vinge, dude. Great books. And part of what happens in these books, they're sci-fi books, is that the, this culture has learned that you cannot under any circumstance, network computers. That's like the worst disaster because the computers will become too smart. Like the, it's basically like millions of years in the future or something and like all of software has become so complex that nobody understands it anymore at all. <laughs> True already. Um, but it's so complex that it's, it's unknowable and dangerous. And so the biggest, most important thing is that you can never let those things get networked because uh, you'll just get destroyed by the AIs. It's absolutely insane. This book is so cool. The other crazy thing about it is that they have inside of the universe, the reason it's called zones of thought is that the closer you get to the universe, the slower um, 
computation works in general. Uh, it, it's kind of weird. It's like the physics of this universe is such that the closer to the galactic core that you get, just like the slower and dumber everything is. And the further out you get, the more dangerous having networked computers is essentially because of some physics thing. It's not really explained, but essentially there's different um, societies that develop as a result. God, so cool. You guys, you need to read this book. I think especially the first one and the second one, the third one gets worse. Honestly, even the second one gets worse. The first one is really the killer book. Anyway, what's up, Lee Rose? Not a fan of crypto. Yeah, I just I, I do kind of see it as a net negative. That's uh, that's my opinion. Read the new Andy Weir book. Andy Weir. Oh, the Martian guy. Oh, that's cool. Project Hail Mary. An irresistible interstellar adventure. It seems cool. I'd like to read some sci fi. I haven't read this in a while. I mean, sci fi in general. All right. Um, so question for you all, how in the world would you test such a thing as this crazy patch that we were just looking at? Um, check out, we're going to make a branch called fix spilling Q leak, or it's not, it's partition Q. How long have I working on Cockroach TV? I so I, I'm an employee of Cockroach Labs and I joined the company in 2016. I've been doing this stream for just about a year. Well, it's maybe about a year and a half at this point, actually. Um, I'm not coding a database from scratch, no. So Cockroach is an open source database that many other people besides me work on. Um, I'm also employed by its author, just to, for full disclosure. Um, I just work on this on stream on Fridays kind of for fun, kind of to spread the good word, um, try to get people interested in database programming, which I think is really awesome. Um, okay, so we're going to make a new commit. We're going to say git add dash p, not this thing. We're going to add this thing. It's a one liner, dude. Oh my God, it's so sad. We don't need this. We don't need this. We're going to say git commit. Um, and the package is call container. Um, fix the memory leak. I guess it's another intra query memory leak in partitioned partitions. I don't know. Uh, previously, um, when closing a partition, the element that's used to, is it partition that we actually closed? This is actually a disk queue. So it's not quite, quite right. Um, do defer. Yeah, that's actually a good call. Look at this. This is called a live code review in case there's an error, right? It's honestly, error conditions here are super suspicious. Then again, okay, here's the other thing though. If we did get an error, everything would just immediately tear down, right? So does it even matter? Go is gonna overtake Python and machine learning? I have no idea, that's a great question. I'm I'm not an expert in machine learning, um, nor am I even a novice, so I guess I have no, no idea. The data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How do you guys you do handle performance in the software team? Do you let juniors in your company? How's the pull request system? Yes, we, we definitely employ a wide diversity of experience level at Cockroach. Um, and in terms, of, in terms of performance testing, in theory, uh, the way that you work on a performance sensitive piece of software should not be to rely on everybody to make perfect commits or even to rely on code reviews to catch mistakes. It should really be all about automated tests and running benchmarks and full system benchmarks, I would say. And we have a great deal of that. Um, one thing that we've noticed on the stream over the past about month and a half, so Cockroach is really an OLTP focused database, a transaction processing database is sort of our core strength. Um, and a lot of I, our strengths are not in the analytics or OLAP side of the house uh, yet. And so we have fewer automated system tests that would catch issues like this or catch issues like, oh man, you know, the performance of the external sorter um, has decreased over time. I, I don't think that we're very good at noticing regressions like that, but we're very sensitive at noting OLTP regressions. Um, so I guess I would say you got to have tests. And if you don't, you're, you're kind of sunk. <laughs> Uh, 
You don't want to rely on people making perfect commits. You should instead be relying on the go garbage collector. Hell yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. <laughs> okay, that being said, we can just take the uh, take the uh, the suggestion here. Do we regularly in employ interns which are still in university? Yes, we definitely have quite a few interns um, each year. We have, you know, a reasonable sized class of interns every year. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, that, that YouTube channel is really awesome. I think that it, if you are really interested in trying to play around with database programming and you want to invest a good amount of time. I really like the course that I linked. I think it's pretty cool. To be honest, I haven't done it since I was in college. So it might be really hard to follow without going to the class at the same time. But this UChicago course called KaiDB, it's really so cool because it's a project that's based off of SQLite that allows you to do a lot of those concepts kind of from scratch in a project-based form. <clears throat> that being said, I guess, to be honest, I haven't done it recently and it might not be the best idea. I don't know. I think you should try it though. I would like somebody to try it and report back. Pros and cons about Cockroach. Is it better than Microsoft SQL or Oracle for enterprise level? Um, so Microsoft SQL, uh, like SQL Server and Oracle, they're, they're older databases, right? And they're more mature databases. What Cockroach has that's new and special is that it's a kind of distributed uh, database product that allows you to have distributed data uh, more easily than uh, kind of the more traditional databases. Like traditionally, you have to do stuff like manual sharding or you have to do async replication to get a distributed database that allows you to have the same data used from more than one location. Or if you have, you need to horizontally scale your system. It can be difficult to do essentially. Cockroach is part of a breed of newer databases that make it a lot easier to horizontally shard your data without having to think about it too much. Um, there's a lot of solutions that you can do manual sharding that get you that scale, but with Cockroach and some other systems like it, you can kind of uh, just throw a lot of data in there, add nodes to the cluster easily, scale horizontally, and sort of hope for the best, and things generally work. Um, another cool thing that we have in Cockroach that's pretty unique um, is really good support for multi-region databases. So not only can you have horizontally scalable databases within a single data center, you can also have geographically distributed databases with relative ease, which is pretty awesome. So if you have customers in the East Coast and customers in the West Coast and customers in Europe, you can set up your database such that you can use a single big database for all of those, All like maybe you're selling products in East, West and Europe, and you want to record the transactions. Um, you can make it so that the latency from that West Coast user is, is good. The latency from that East Coast user is good. And the latency from that Europe user is good. And Cockroach gives you some primitives that you can use to, to make your data architecture such that this stuff is relatively easy. So I don't know if that was too coherent, but uh, that's kind of the idea. What's up, safe? B plus tree. Anyway, so I need to, I don't know. I need to work on my sales pitches. I feel like they're bad. I feel like I could get so crisp and I, I, I'm not there. <laughs> it's, not, it's clearly not my job. It's clearly not my job to be a salesperson. Nah, Martin, what's up? Thank you all, by the way, for those follows. Appreciate you. You can run Cockroach easily on Kubernetes because it's scalable. Yeah, that's true. I have to narrow down the search. That's true. How are you going to do that? We also offer a, a hosted Cockroach DB called Cockroach Cloud, which you can check out. Um, soon we'll have a, a, a serverless Cockroach Cloud, which I'm really, really excited about. So that's going to be about a metered billing mode of using Cockroach DB. I think it's truly the dream. Check this out. Imagine you have a data API in the cloud. You can speak SQL to it and you pay for just what you use. You're paying for, you know, the amount of bytes read, the amount of bytes written and the amount of bytes stored, probably some CPU cost in there as well. But if you're doing nothing in the database and you're just storing some data, you're paying basically cents. You're, basi you're basically paying almost nothing. And over time, imagine that data API also gives you those multi-region functionality. So, you know, you're running your crazy serverless architecture stuff. There's lambdas going on everywhere. You know, you're deploying this stuff and you have this really fast, low latency access 
to a giant database that you can deal with without having to deploy anything. You don't have to think about clusters. You don't think have to have think about like data locality region so much. You know, it's it's kind of a, I think what a nice future of SQL could be kind of like a a SQL API that doesn't make you have to think about physical data placement. It's kind of what it comes down to or scalability. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping that's going to be really, really awesome. We have a serverless beta. We looked at it on the stream like several months ago, the Cockroach serverless beta. It's a free for everything. You could check it out. Go to Cockroach Cloud um, and get your serverless free database for free or whatever. But um, we're not quite ready to have that paid metered thing yet. But the paid metered thing is going to be super sick. I'm really excited for it. Will that product be called Cockroach DB infestation? <laughs> Uh, we, we, we've played around with a few like gross metaphors like that. And, uh, I don't know. I think they have mixed, mixed utility. We already get enough slack from places like Hacker News. They're like, I would never use a database called Cockroach CB. The very name disgusts me. And I'm like, who are you who, who's saying that? Like, I, I just don't know about that. It's, it's suspicious. It's suspicious. If you're if you're analyzing a product based purely on its name, I think that maybe you aren't necessarily the right person to be making the database decision, right? Like let's say you had five databases. One was called like some terrible name, like cockroach db or like poop db, but they were like the best databases ever. And you you could tell that actually by by looking at the software and reading about them. And then you had some really nice named databases like angel db, but they were terrible. Would you pick angel db? I'm just not sure. <laughs> the name is really fitting since it's made of a bunch of smaller components and designed to be hard to kill. Exactly. We should create a new database called our SQL. The other thing Valak that's we like about the cockroach metaphor is that it, you know, cockroaches, they've spread everywhere. They're on every continent <laughs> and they're, uh, they, they kind of multiply easily. They horizontally scale. And so, so we think that the database can kind of do that stuff too. All right. This is going to be the, the slowest commit message ever. So when 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 closing a disk queue, the structure that's used to implement uh, disk, it's essentially the structure that's used to implement uh, disk spilling. Um, we failed to properly close all scratch memory uh that is used i mean it's it's really probably probably allow all scratch memory to be reclaimed by the garbage collector uh this this could cause um queries that uh, I mean, it, it's, it, I don't even know what to say in this commit message. It's a little awkward. It's like, this is a terrible bug and it shouldn't have existed. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And I'm going to go down to release note and I'll say release note, SQL change, um, uh, prevent intra query leak during disk spilling that could cause queries to, uh, cause the database to run out of memory uh, during certain, <laughs> especially like we could say, especially during disk spilling operations that uh, disk spilling operations on tables with wide rows. How about that as a reasonable, reasonable concept? As an end user, you use DoorDash over Postmates because the name is more catchy. Yeah, that's fair for a consumer, super consumery product, I guess. S survive nuclear bombs. So scratch memory is just about um, if you need some extra space to do stuff. Like in this particular case, it's about, you know, we we slurp a bunch of compressed bytes into memory, and then we're going to take those compressed bytes and decompress them. And rather than having to keep allocating fresh space, 
to do that operation, since we're doing it over and over again, we reuse that buffer and we call that scratch space. Um, but scratch space is kind of, it's just sort of a general concept that you can use uh, in many different circumstances. It's just like, if you have a little buffer that you wanna keep reusing for random stuff, you could call that scratch space, I guess. It's not really a technical term. It's just a little uh, turn of speech, I guess. Part-time job is my sequel. How do you like my sequel? What do people think of my sequel? Um, got a squash. I didn't fix the, the defer thing. That's a good point. So git add three, git commit amend. Oh wait, did I get DC? That's not the right one. Git restore page one, git add two, git commit amend. All right, so let's go ahead and stash this stuff. We're gonna get rebase I origin master. We're gonna get rid of these two things. Rather not talk about my sequel. Oh, save. I'm sorry, buddy. I know you were hurt by that program. Um, if you can run cockroach with very little downtime, have you solved the cap theorem? Definitely not. So cockroach is explicitly a CP system. So consistent and partition tolerant at the price of availability. And so just picking CP doesn't mean that you can't be what we call highly available. Um, and it's it's a pretty common pattern to have a database that's CP and HA or highly available. It doesn't, it, it's kind of just like, you can administer a system such that it's up a lot, but at its core, um, if you ever do have an issue such like, like such as uh, more than a quorum of your replication group, your consensus group dying, that means that the database will not be able to make progress on that replication group. And given that, that's the CP, right? It's like, if that stuff happens, if you lose that max, that, that quorum, um, in Cockroach, we do replication at this range level. So if you have a particular range and two out of its three replicas, if you're doing replication factor three go down, then you won't be able to write to that range. Um, and that's, that's why it's sort of CP or consistent partition tolerant as opposed to available in an AP system, uh, you wouldn't be ha able to do consistent things, uh, <laughs> but you would be able to write to a replication group that did not have something like a quorum of available replicas ish little hand wavy, but that, that's the general idea. Okay. So cool one-liner dude cool one-liner um should i let's see um i also want to say i think i'm going to actually make a quick issue about this just because it's such a clear repro we probably should make a test around this or something i it's not exactly clear how you would test this in a nice way but i'll, I'll just make one anyway sequel um can um server with a an external sort with wide rows. Um, okay, so here's what we're gonna say. So thank you to M Lazowick. Is M Lazowick on uh, on the GitHub's? That sounds right. Thank you, M Lazowick, for discovering this issue. Repro. Um, so let's see. Let's just quickly copy paste this repro. We're gonna say create table T. We're gonna just grab this. Um, to reproduce, create a table with wide rows and force an external sort. It will use too much memory and with a large enough table, crash a server. How many employees at Cockroach? Um, yeah, it's it's in it's like in the three hundred territory, so it's a pretty active repository, I would say. Um,
the data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How are you gonna do that? By guessing. Everybody knows that relational databases don't scale because they use joint... I think the cap theorem is presented in an overcomplicated way. It just says, if you don't have access to the canonical version of a piece, you can either refuse to serve CP or serve possibly stale AP. Yeah, that's nice. JB Pratt, thank you so much for the tier one subscription for six months. Really appreciate your support. What is this little guy? ACS, a couple streams. I like that. It's very cute. Little cat, little heart. I'm into it. Um, okay, so... Um, then the run on external sort, external sort, um, so we're going to say, we're going to copy and paste this prepare, and then we can copy and paste the execute as well. So well, let's turn this run an external sort that needs to keep the large column resident memory run with discard rows to keep the execution from having print all of the bytes um, with enough data this will crash the server. Okay. So we're going to make a C bug. We're going to put it over here. And we'll make it in. It's, it's even an S2 because it does cause a crash. So that's exciting. So then I'm going to go back to my pull request that I made. And I'm going to add a closes 66107. <clears throat> How about a synchronous synchronous code review from Yahor, who's also watching this stream? Is this legit? Are you allowed to? <laughs> So what are you, what are you guys' philosophy on pair programming and then code reviewing from the person who is pairing? Legit or not legit? I feel like that's a that's an interesting question to talk about. Person A and person B pair programs on something. Person A submits, person B approves. You just merge that whole thing. Done. I feel like it's good. I mean, I think that's good to go. Like I think pair programming is way more high throughput high brain melding, high likelihood to catch mistakes than an ordinary code review. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yes, that is a leftover. So let's see. Um, you guys know about reset dash P. It's pretty awesome. So we're going to keep this one. We're going to apply this one. We'll do git commit amend. And then we just have this thing left. We can delete it. And then our leftover commit is just the defer. So we wanted to add a comment too. That was a comment. Um, so we're going to edit this guy again. Um, zero out the structure completely upon return. We, I mean, honestly, this is, I just feel like every close should do this essentially. Um, if people, if uh, users of this disk queue retain pointers, retain a pointer to it, and we don't uh, remove all references to large backing slices, such as scratch, various scratch spaces in this struct and children will be leaking memory until users remove their references. I prefer that another person review 
after the pair programming session, more eyes to catch things. Reset and add dash peer super useful if you're like me and forget to do smaller commits. Yeah, absolutely. The patch edit is super cool too. Oh, it's so fun. It's so fun. Super fun. I always feel like I have a, a, a I feel like I'm a Git master when I'm using the dash P stuff. I'm just like making commits out of thin air, restructuring, reordering. It's so fun. It really feels, uh, it feels gratifying if you're good at that. Do you hear my neighbor yelling at his dog? I'm not sure if you can, can you hear my neighbor yelling at his dog? He's like, rock, come on, bro. His dog's name rock. And he's like, he's always yelling at the dog. I feel bad. Rock, Rock is this big, dumb looking bulldog. I mean, like a huge dog and like really slow, possibly. But this guy yells at him a little bit too much. He's like always annoyed. He's like, Rock, come on, don't do that. I'm like, he just doesn't understand you. Give that guy love. All right. He's really slow, just like those web pages. Who gave me this rocket? Yeah, I thought it would be M. Lazowick. All right. This is teamwork. This is teamwork. This is teamwork. All right. So. How do you think about writing databases with Rust? We are fixing a memory issue now. Do you think Rust might help in this regard? That's a great question. So I, I'm not so familiar with using Rust. I do know that unless you're careful, you'll still have the same kind of issue, right? Because in Rust, even though there's no garbage collector, you still have to remember to like remove references or let go of things, right? Right? I mean, you keep track of these lifetimes. Maybe the explicit lifetime tracking helps a good deal. I don't know. Who knows Rust? Who, who knows Rust here? And who could tell me whether a problem like this would exist in Rust or not? I certainly don't know myself. Maybe it would help. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. So... Influx is rewriting from Go to Rust. Oh my God, that's a huge project. That's like an insanely big project. I can't believe it. It's so cool. Try, thinking about rewriting CockroachDB in Rust gives me like a horrible nightmare. Because I mean, essentially in Cockroach, we've been writing code nonstop for like six years is how it feels. Like, yes, there's been some refactors, some rewrites, some changes. You know, you wouldn't have to redo all of those changes. But just like, the raw amount of code in there, it's absolutely massive. <laughs> so that, that definitely scares me a little bit. A hey, Matt Zen, thank you for the rocket emote as well. So what do we do now? Uh, we fixed this, this is good. Go, just write a go to Rust transpiler. Stats viz, this thing. What were we gonna do besides this again? Um, we were going to look at this MVCC explain analyze stuff. We could look at that. You hear that guy, right? Yelling at his dog. Makes me sad, honestly. He's like my direct neighbor. If I look out the window right there, like I can see the guy yelling at his poor dog. So sad. Just Google go to Rust converter. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna Google it. Go to uh my G key isn't working. Guys, I have a real problem. <laughs> I have a real problem. Wait, what? My G key is working in here, but not over here. What is that about? Okay, go to Rust compiler. It was probably, yeah. So I have this kind of broken, um, I have these auto hotkey scripts 
So this is the only cringe thing about Windows is that you write a lot of auto hotkey scripts and auto hotkey while amazing is a pretty janky programming language. And uh, I feel like my little auto hotkey scripts have some bugs in them. Go to Rust compiler. It doesn't seem to exist. That's the only cringe thing about Windows. Okay, okay, okay. I take it back. It's not the only cringe thing about Windows. It's a cringe thing about Windows. Okay, this thing. Yeah. All right. I like the keyboard. The keyboard's great. I'm a big fan. So we were going to... What should we do, man? What should we do? So the other thing that we were going to maybe do... Go to Rust Transpiler. Okay, I'll search for that. Rustthon, dude. Rustthon. I, I don't, I, I don't like this. I don't like it at all, and I'm no longer gonna participate in this nonsense. <laughs> Um, what I wanted to look at was maybe this one. So here's this PR that we did a few weeks ago. It's on a slightly different note. Oh, you know what we should maybe do actually, maybe before we do that, we should. No, 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 never mind, never mind. So here's what we did a few weeks ago. We were thinking about how to display to the user that their scans are slow because of old data versions in the database. So we know how MVCC works, right, everybody? The way it works is that all data is immutable. And if you were to edit a piece of data, instead of actually editing it in place, we make a new version of that data. And when we read data, we are always trying to read the newest version before the timestamp at which we are reading. And so there's a bunch of reasons why we do this, but that's sort of the core purpose of it. Open a task to add mem disk usage. Yeah, I was going to say that, but I think we actually do have an issue for this. And I, in fact, think that somebody might be doing it soon. So I don't want to step on their toes. But yes, I, I do think that I'm fairly sure we have an issue for this, don't we? Like, let's see. Mm, memory usage, explain, analyze. Could have sworn we had a ticket for it. But maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. Do we not? Do we not? I really thought we did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know, man. I kind of, I kind of thought we did. I think here's what's going to happen. If I open this issue in about a couple of hours, somebody's going to close it and be like, this is a duplicate, <laughs> but I'll open it anyway. Okay. Um, we'll try it out. So SQL. Dude, this guy's just a... It's, it's very suspicious. He's really yelling a lot at this little dog. Don't do anything that's going to get me clipped. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. I can't. I can't. I'm not going to deal with that guy. He's my neighbor. I, I, it feels wrong to interrupt a man abusing his own dog. I mean, I hope that you get the irony. You shouldn't be abusing dogs, obviously. But I uh, feel like it's not, not a good idea to get in the middle of that, probably. <laughs> it's a guy who lives across the street from you. 
I will, this guy, one time, did I tell you this story? I think I did. One night, we were hanging out. Police come. The police come and uh, they arrest this guy. They take him into their car and we're like, what the literal fuck is going on? And um, as he's getting handcuffed and pulled into the car, which by the way, like, why? Like, you know, police, it's complicated, right? Like they, whoa, who called this? Like, is it, was it his like person who lives in them with the house? Like, was it, uh, who knows? But as, anyway, as he's being walked to the car, he's like, he's like all of this over my bird. And I do think that they have a bird in there because sometimes we hear squawking noises. And I'm like, did you kill, did you kill your own bird, dude? I don't know. It's, it's a little weird. Um, but this is what you get in Brooklyn, I guess. You get, uh, you get neighbors who do stuff, right, guys? Does anybody else live in a city? Is this normal? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's all good. Moving on then. Back to the, back to the other stuff. <laughs> um, all right. Include memory usage in textual explain analyze um explain analyze this sequel shows memory usage per operator it also shows temporary disk usage per operator uh, we should have the same information in the textual explain analyze so let's get some examples, if we can. We still have them in our paste buffer, which we do. Very cool. Why don't we can just paste this whole thing. We can paste this whole thing into uh, the issue, right? Where's the issue? It's over here. Uh, do do. Here's an example. And let's actually open this guy up and we can paste in what this thing looks like just so it's easier to read in the issue. Um, as you can see, the image contains um, max memory allocated and max sql temp memory whatever max memory allocated and max sql temp disk used in the sort node but the textual version actual output does not So we're gonna we're gonna mark this. We have a little new tag for this. It's called a SQL. Um, a SQL explain. All right. So how about that? As a nice little issue. How about that as a nice little issue? All right. I'm gonna leave that one alone because I think it's a good one. That's a good one to get started with. And we're looking for some good issues to get started with for various reasons right now. So actually let's, let's reopen this guy back up here. And what I wanted to go back to was this MBCC thing. I feel like this is a reasonable one for us to, to play with again. So let's take Let's, let's take another look. Remember what we were talking about what happens when a scan is slow because it's got a lot of MBCC data inside. What do we do? Right now, there's no way to know as a user, your scan's slow all of a sudden, but it's only giving you hundred rows, but it's taking about the same time as it would take if there were 500 rows. What is that about? It's just about how the data architecture works inside of Cockroach, MBCC, extra versions. They haven't been cleaned up yet. So the question is, can we expose that information in any useful way? I think the answer should be yes. And uh, I took a stab at this on the stream one month ago, April 30th. 
I played around, I messed around, and uh, I think I made a prototype that made no sense. <laughs> Luckily, we have some colleagues who know better how the storage engine works. And uh, Sumir here made an awesome improvement to Pebble, which is our storage engine, um, that I think we can use to make this stuff happen. Cocker CV has 3.8 thousand issues. So here's the thing you have to know about the issues. The issues in Cocker CV, they're, they're mostly like improvements or tasks. Thing. So it's not like there's 3.8 thousand bugs um, necessarily. I think there's a lot of bugs, but there's a lot of bugs in every software product. I think what this is about is just a reflection of the fact that we use issues with, um, with abandon. We'll just make issues for any old reason. To do's, things to keep track of, potential improvements. We've got some uh, some nice ways to look at them too. If you there's all of these labels. If you if you scroll around in the labels here, you can see all sorts of different categorizations and groupings and stuff like that that you can use to kind of try to get a sense for what's going on there. But it's not as bad as it sounds. I mean, it's kind of bad, but it's not as bad as it sounds. You know what we actually recently did though is that we we turned on one of those bots that's like it's gonna close stuff if it's been open for too long. I think it, it might be a little controversial, we'll see, but it's gonna automatically, if an issue that's been older, it's been open for more than like 18 months, I think, it's gonna like put a close label on it. If nobody touches it again for another couple of weeks, it'll auto close the issue. So we'll see if that like pisses off a lot of people, but I think it could be probably pretty healthy for the state of the, uh, the repository. It's reasonable, but on the other hand, like you guys saw that old Firefox bug, like oldest Firefox bug just closed. You saw this, right? Um, or this one, 15 year old bug still unfixed. No, no, this is, what about this one? 17 year old request just closed. So this is kind of cool though, right? It's like somebody opened this thing 17 years ago and then they finally fixed it. It's kind of nice. Like maybe if they, maybe if this bug had been auto closed, Nobody would have remembered to fix it at all. Oh yeah, native context menus. Native context menu Firefox. After 21 years, we finally have whatever. Native context menus in Macs. Amazing. Truly amazing. So... Coming back to our MVCC stuff then. <laughs> um, coming back to our MVCC stuff. Sumir added this patch. My question is, what does it do exactly? So we have this new thing called iterator stats. Iteration sets. We de directly expose pebble.iterator stats. Callers may want to aggregate and interpret these in the following manner. Aggregate forward reverse, seek count and step count. Interpret the four aggregated stats as follows. Seek count, step count. We can refer to these simply as seek count, step count in logs, metrics, traces. These represent explicit calls by the implementation of MVCC iterator in response to the caller of MVCC iterator. A high count 44 second compilation time? No, this was the this was the time it took to actually run the query. It wasn't just compiling it. Um, a high count relative to the unique MVCC keys returned suggests that there are many versions for the same key. C count, step count, internal iter call. We can refer to these simply as internal C count, internal step count. If these are significantly larger than the ones in the preceding bullet, it suggests that there are lots of uncompacted deletes or stale pebble versions that need to be compacted away. This should be rare, but has been observed. Interesting. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at that. Let's let's actually, first of all, check out our, our PR here. Track MVCC keys red. So uh, let's see. Get checkout, track MVCC keys red. Local changes would be overridden by checkout. Uh, vendor. Get submodule update.
All right, so um, what's going on here? Let's first of all rebase this thing on Origin Master. We have huge amounts of, no, no, we just have one small change here, which is the API proto. So why did I change the API proto? What is what is going on here? Get DC. The data bank's too big. I have to narrow down ah, so I added scan stats. It's a message that will be attached to batch responses containing information about what happened during each scan and get in the request. Now, my question is when this happens, where is it getting exposed into? I don't know. Why don't we for now just run make proto buff? And um, we can just commit the result and then we can kind of take a look at what Sumir's work is giving us in terms of the extra interfaces. It's about to become the golden hour inside my house, AKA, or my face is completely bathed in sunlight. Like, this is like a Joker kind of situation. Check this out. I'm half in sun and half in shadow. Welcome to Gotham City. Uh, wait, the Joker? I think I meant, what's this guy's name? Two-Face? Yeah, I meant Two-Face. Look, I'm not a comics guy. I'm not a comics guy. Harvey Dent. Okay, this is how to get chat excited. Just talk about comic book characters and they're all gonna start, they're all gonna start chiming in. Okay, let's update our project as well. So we're gonna say commands, edit, project, um, adding MBCC garbage statistics to explain output in CockroachDB. How about that? Oakley dokley. Let us now take a look at what's next here. So inside of engine.go, we should be looking now. Um, inside of engine.go, we've got something called stats now. That's isn't caused called by anybody yet, but it can be. It's my username, how I chat up the ladies. Viable clan member, dude. I thought that your name was VTable clan member. I feel like that would be more of a programmer kind of thing. VTable guy. <laughs> All right. So who is calling this stats thing? And when could we be calling it? When's the right time to be calling this stats thing? I don't, I don't have any idea, honestly. Who calls it close on this thing? Um, yeah, I don't even know where we're at. This is still like rather deep, I would say. Still rather deep. We need to take a look at how our patch was doing anything at all for a second. Maybe we can search for num mvcc. Okay, so the change that we did was inside of Pebble MVCC scanner. So let's go down into there. So Pebble, by the way, it's the name of our storage engine. You guys know about RocksDB? We used to use RocksDB, but then we switched away from it because we decided that we wanted to write our own storage engine. It's called Pebble. Check it out. It's sick. Totally sick. Thanks for the follows, y'all. Um, now the idea was that we were keeping track of this num seeks thing, which we're going to stop doing. And then we're going to actually use it inside of MVCC get, and also probably MVCC scan. Hopefully here's the scan. 
So I think the idea is that here we should be able to say something like MECC scanner dot. There should be like a stats thing, which we need to implement. To do implement me. OK, I'm going to be doing this to do in about five seconds because I got to go to the bathroom. Be right back, y'all. Um, let's see. So Mortali, God, refocus. Sometimes this thing really struggles to notice me. Notice me. Notice me. There we go. Do you believe larger database management companies would look to acquire Cockroach Labs? If they could, I think they'd love to. No, I'm just joking. I have no comment on that. No comment on that. Um, I got a snack for myself called walnuts. You guys like walnuts? Big walnut fan over here on the stream. Mmm, delicious walnuts. I usually go almonds on the stream today. Walnuts. How do you describe the taste of a walnut? It's kind of a unique taste, isn't it? Texture is also kind of unique. Woody. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a little woody. All right. All right. So uh, the stats. How do we how do we get these stats out? We need to get the iterator stats. I think this thing should have an iterator inside, right? Parent. The parent. When I say hmm, yeah. How does this how does this work? How does anything work? Walnuts are great. Mmm, delicious walnuts. Next key, iter next, iter valid. Parent, not valid. Can I just call parent.stats basically? <laughs> what are these dots, dude? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> you tell me. Okay, let's implement this MVCC scanner.stats thing. Should be very simple. Basically just says return p dot parent dot p dot parent dot stats. Yeah? Iterator stats. All 
Um, is this legit? Can I just do this? Or is there some interface I need to implement? It seems like I can just do this, right? Uh, I don't know. MBCC scanner dot. Oh, people are just reaching right into this thing. I don't even need to do what I'm doing right now. I can just say MBCC. Well, it feels weird to like call the parent because nobody else is really calling this thing. But uh, I'll just do it. It's fine. So stats equal to MVCC scanner dot stats. Then when we record structured, right. So let's again take a look now at what the documentation is here. Oh, wow. So it's kind of interesting. Forward seek, reverse seek, forward step, reverse step. Mm. I don't think I care too much about forward and reverse here. A high count relative to the unique. So seek versus step. Do I care about seek and step? I don't know. I guess we'll just we'll just play around. We'll see what happens if we play around with this. So we get our we got our stats dot stats. Um, and we're gonna say steps is equal to I guess it's like hmm. Step is equal to stats dot reverse step count of and then these things are num stats kind. So it's interface call versus internal iter call. Interface call. Plus stats dot step count pebble dot interface call and then seeks is equal to this all right so we got our steps and our seeks and these are our interface steps and seeks and then we also want to have our internal steps versus seeks like this Pebble dot internal iter call. I guess I could clean this up by doing like a little loop. But we'll keep it like this for now. And then I guess in my scan stats, I should probably just return all of this stuff, right? So instead of just having num mbcc keys and num seeks, well, what is num mbcc keys read? Had to, oh, I don't care about this stuff. I think what I, what I really care about um, cause we, we've got num keys, we've got num bytes. Mm, I think what we want here is I think we just want to have all four of these quantities, step seeks, internal steps and internal seeks, right? I'm guessing it's kind of hard to know, like how, as a user, you definitely don't care about all of this detail. But I guess as long as we have it, we might as well use it. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But Anyway, let's just, uh, we'll, we'll go for it for now. So we're going to have UN64 num, num seeks. So num interface seeks. On the other hand, should I just expose all of the detail? Just pull it all the way out? No, I don't think we need that. So we have num interface seeks, num internal seeks, and then num interface steps, num internal steps. So one, two, three, four. Okay, and we can fill out the docs on these later. <laughs> um, so make protobuf. Okay. 
All right. So then, uh, then we can go ahead and actually edit them. So we're just going to say num interface seeks is equal to seeks um, internal seeks is equal to internal seeks exclamation point food. That's genius. Okay. We're going to make that commands add food. Uh, I'm probably eating almonds on the stream or maybe walnuts. Okay. So I guess we have to UN 64 of these as well. Walmonds. So this is going to be num interface steps, num internal steps, steps, internal steps. Okay. So like, so, okay. And then what? Um, and then what? So we, we have to do the same thing over there. So this is code that should be probably uh, pulled out into a little function. So maybe we can make the function like this whole thing more or less. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll call it uh, funk record record. Maybe call it record like record iterator stats. And it's going to take a trace span or whatever. Is it trace.span? Tracing.span. Not to be confused with the trace.span, a completely different concept. So it's going to take a tracing.span. It's going to take a uh, pebble iterator. Or should it? No, it should probably just take a stats. So an iterator stats. Iterator stats. Okay, so then here's what we're going to do. We're just going to paste in this whole big body. And I think we can actually fix it to only do stuff if trace band is not nil, which means it's going to look like this. We're going to stick this up over here. We're going to call this span instead of, well, let's call it trace span. I think that makes more sense. Trace span. Since span is such an overloaded word, it's definitely confusing. So then we can say um, iterator stats. And then we can say stats is equal to iterator stats dot because this thing also has like an, a sub stats thing, which is what we actually want. How come it doesn't stats dot stats? All right. So then we can actually call our function. We can do it in two places. We're going to say uh, record iterator stats on trace span comma MVCC scanner dot stats. Yeah. I actually think that this should be lowercase because everything is lower. We're not exporting this at all. So it isn't necessary to do that. We don't want this. We just want these two refactor. Okay. Fantastic. So the, then we just have to change the other call site because I think there's two of them. Like this. Um, all right. So now what? We've got our new stats set up, which is cool. And then we have to just figure out how to read them later. The other thing we have to do is get rid of our janky attempt that we tried last time at actually adding these stats. And somebody did it correctly. We should delete what we've added, um, which was this num MVCC business in Pebble MVCC scanner. So this whole thing, num MVCC, this can die altogether. And then all of the places where we edit can also die. Just get rid of all that stuff. All right. So that's going to be a bit cleaner, which is great. Um, we also want to delete that straight comment, which seems useless. So while get rid of that. Okay. 
So the next step is now we need to go looking at this KV stats thing that we're editing all over the place. KV stats. This is sort of just like a stats bubbling up propagation exercise. TBQH. TBQH. So we could just go look at whoops, our zigzag join. Not this one. Zigzag joiner. It should have some errors. I'm confused why it isn't uh, having any errors. So this is in line 990. Huh? Oh, I see. Okay, so scan sets at num MVCC keys. I see. So we need to change a, a few more things here as well. So the event has got all of these different items now, num internal steps, internal seeks, interface steps, and interface seeks. <clears throat> so we're just going to do the same thing here. We'll say num, MV, uh, num internal steps. So yeah, num interface steps, num internal steps. And yes, you, you might notice we do have a bit of duplication here. There's these fields that are repeated in a few places. Eh, that's just life. I don't know if it's so bad. So steps and seeks. And these are all UN 64s. The reason is one of them is a proto buff and one of them is this in memory structure that we use to aggregate stuff inside of instead of the proto itself. So num internal steps and we just do this four times. Interface steps. Careful to get this stuff right. Bugs in this kind of looking code where it's like identical looking are always really irritating. So let's make sure to get this stuff right. Interface steps, interface steps internal steps, internal steps, then we're going to say interface seeks and interface seeks. Then we're going to say internal seeks, internal seeks. Okay, so that's great. And then this stuff should be broken looking. And that's because we've got to do yet another propagation of protos. Very janky, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's a bit janky. That's okay. We're going to persevere. Interface steps. Copy it a bunch of times. Internal interface seeks. Internal seeks. Six, seven, eight. All right. We're going to remake our proto buffs again. I'm not exactly sure why we have these two layers of proto buffs. It seems a little bit suspicious. Don't it? Don't it? All right, I'm going full Harvey Dent. Full Harvey Dent. Um, okay, so coming back to Zigzag Joiner, now this thing is busted, so we've got to... It kind of feels like we ought to make a little helper for this, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Like a turn z.scanstats into kv stats kind of thing. Let's make one. Um, so we're going to call it, uh, maybe it can go inside of the exec infra PB package component stats dot go. All right. Well, first there's a bunch of stuff to fix here, so we'll. So here, here's, I think, where we can have a little bit of uh, judiciousness, I would say, in the way that we output this stuff. I think part of it is that we probably want to have some sort of verbosity mode here. so that we can know that in certain cases, we don't want to emit all this detail. If we don't have a lot of detail, we want to do that, the heuristic that Sumir described, which is that only output this internal seek stuff if it's like significantly greater than the interface seeks, is the idea. Yeah, so I don't know. Um, I 
I don't know what that looks like, honestly. So we're going to do interface steps. Well, now we're just going to go full detail and it's probably going to be gross and impossible to interpret. And this one goes down here. This one comes up here. So we're going to do internal steps as value KVM VCC steps internal num internal steps interface steps internal steps interface steps. This needs to be interface seeks internal seeks. All right, so that's that. Uh, N. Shoalhorn, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome in, everybody, to the stream. We're working on CockroachDB, the distributed SQL, da SQL database written in Go. We're working on exposing statistics about the amount of MVCC garbage that you read during a scan to the user. Yay! <laughs> what, what were you up to on the stream, N. Shoalhorn? Thanks, uh, thanks again for the raid. I hope you guys had a good stream. Um, and everything like that. Tell me, give me the, give me the goss, give me the deets. Right now I'm doing a very boring thing and just doing a bunch of boilerplate kind of stuff, to be honest. Uh, copy and pasting a bunch of code, basically, to manipulate these stats payloads. It's really exciting. We were doing operating system development. But we hit a dead end. <laughs> Raid someone who gets stuff done. I mean, I would say, okay, like, let me talk about getting stuff done for a quick second. Here's the PR that we submitted earlier. Here's the PR that we submitted earlier. It took us three hours to submit this PR, which changed one line of code. So what do you think about that? Is that is that somebody who gets something done or is that somebody who writes three lines of code per hour? <laughs> uh, granted, it was a bit hard to find this, but I, I, I don't know if this counts as getting a, a lot of stuff done. Um, so it wasn't CockroachDB written in Erlang? No, CockroachDB was never written in Erlang. It's always been a Go database. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you're getting the full scope of my neighborhood right now. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's this lady who likes to sing who all, who lives next door to the guy with the dog. I don't think it's coming through the microphone. Can you hear that? Probably not. Anyway, whatever. Anyway, so this is uh, this is what's up. Doing the stats. We're doing the stats. Trying to help people to understand. Why are my scans slow? Even though I'm scanning the same amount of data. The answer is it's not really the same amount of data. There's extra data that's hidden because it's garbage and it'll get deleted, but only later. We're trying to help people see that. That's the goal. Yeah, the, the lady's singing, but it's not loud enough to come through my microphone. <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a sweeter sound than the guy yelling at his dog, to be honest. So I'm sad you guys can't hear it, but it's just a little bit too faint at the moment. Interface seeks, interface seeks, interface seeks. Then we got to do internal seeks, internal seeks, internal seeks. Okay. Then uh, there's just two more little things here. We've got to do interface steps. Internal steps, internal steps, I said. Interface. This is where it's like, I wish I had reflection. That would make things a lot, a bit, a bit easier here. Uh, but so be it. Interface seeks. Internal seeks, rather. Internal seeks. It's like, I'm doing something wrong. We should be using arrays. You know, you could loop over it and stuff like that, but whatever. It is all right. It is all right. So coming back, we were going to make a little utility function that given scan stats, 
which lives in the exec infra package. So that's going to be a little bit of a problem. That means we have to do it inside of exec infra. Given this scan stats, it's going to add it to the. Oh, do we not have I'm a little bit nervous about dependencies here. Okay, so RG exec infra PB package SQL exec infra. Am I allowed to import one from the other? Yes, I totally can do that, which is great. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Uh, yeah, you guys check out um, N. Shulhorn's channel. Drop him a follow. Make sure to do that. Thanks again for that raid. Um, so, right. The function is going to say, it's going to say what? It's going to be like, maybe, it, you know, it could be even, it could even be a function on scan stats. Does that make sense as a concept? Scan sets dot add to or something like that. So we can say SS scan stats. Um, and, and we're going to be adding it to what? What? Uh, it's add to KV stats. It's a little weird. Doesn't feel like a, doesn't really feel like a method, but. It's not going to be a method. It makes no sense to have this be a method. It'll be a function. It'll be like func um, add. Um, it's like populate KV stats, maybe. It's going to take an SS scan stats. It's actually, it's going to take an, a, um, an address of a exec infra PB dot KV stats. And it's going to take an address of a scan stats. And it's gonna okay so we're gonna say populate kv stats adds data from the input aggregation why is it called that kv stats from the input scan stats to the input kv stats all right so then we're gonna just say kv stats dot yeah you know this whole fun stuff again where we just copy and paste the same four lines of code yet again so it's gonna be interface seeks equals ss.num interface seeks. Except the types are different, huh? Why is that? Oh, it's because we got an optional make uint it. Okay, so we'll say optional dot make uint like this. All right, so then we do this four times. Make sure that this does not say internal and it should say interface, a critical mistake. That would be interface seeks internal seeks and then we're going to do we're going to copy this and we're going to make these okay i guess we can say replace seek with step g okay very good so then back over here in zigzag joiner we can get rid of this and we can say uh uh exec infra dot populate kv stats kv stats comma z dot scan stats yeah seems good and then we're going to do the same thing for all of these little kv stats guys which we have a few of um kv stats so there's going to be probably one for each of the things that read stuff from disk in sql so that's zigzag joiner uh inverted joiner we'll do that one next inverted join inverted join Ner? Joiner. Okay, so here we're going to do the same thing. Except, of course, uh, we've got to be a little bit tricky about it because of reasons. So we can say ret is equal to this. Get rid of this. We can say populate KV stats. We're going to pass in ret.kv. We're going to pass in ij.scanstats. Return ret. All right. And then we're going to do the same thing for the next one, which is going to be join reader. Same idea. Same thing. We're going to say ret is equal to this. Get rid of this thing. Exec infra.populate kv stats ret.kv 
then we're going to do um, FIS, address of FIS. Dot scan stats. No, wait, where do I, what was this coming from again? JR dot scan stats. Okay. So we'll say JR dot scan stats. All right. Return red. And then the last one is going to be table reader, I think. This one doesn't have it. KB stats. This one should have it. We can fix that. So we'll say ret is equal to this. Return ret. We're going to say ret dot populate KV stats of ret dot KV. We should be coming to the end of this soon, you guys. We'll, we'll have a we'll have a nice demo, I think. I'm hope I'm hopeful that we'll have a nice demo in a second. So is dot. We don't have scan stats on this thing. Why is that? Or is it tr dot fetcher dot scan stats? Or is it tr dot scan? Hmm. Uh, mystery. Jr. Dot scan sets. Who populates this thing? Exec infra. Dot get scan scan get scan stats. If it's not closed, then get it. So we do we not do that? Scan stats. Why is that that we don't do this? Uh, why is that? Why does it need to be done in close? Don't understand that. It's a bit confusing. But hey, why argue with tradition, right? Why argue with tradition? We're just going to do exactly the same old pattern. We apparently do it in close, which I find fascinating and confusing, but uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. If it's not closed, then do some stuff. So we're going to just say uh, tr.scan stats is equal to, and we have to, of course, make a field over here. Put it over here. And we're going to say tr.scanscats is equal to get scan stats from the tr.context. Then we're going to just populate context with my tr.scan stats. Cool. And then is there, is there another one? KV stats. Who else is looking at this thing? Zigzag joiner we got. Join reader we got. Inverted joiner we got. So we just missed the table reader in this, didn't we? That's uh, that's kind of funny. I'm confused. I feel like there's probably some reason why this was working before, and I don't, I didn't see it. But um, perhaps not. It show. All right. Well, uh, it's all good. So let's go ahead and uh, compile. Go ahead and compile, see what we get. Golden's hour. Golden hour is over. I can lean back and not get blinded. That's exciting. Okay, so something went wrong here. Num MVCC keys undefined. Yes, indeed, those do not exist. So an API API.go. Okay. API.go. What do we need to fix here? Maybe some string methods or something? Num keys. Oh, it's like some combined thing, right? Uh, scan stats. Oh, it's when we print these things. Um, skipped D keys. D internal. Dot D times. The internal you like the use of sot <laughs> i had a good laugh of that so num interface keys num num interface steps s dot num interface num internal steps so it's not skipped stepped d times 
and we're going to say s dot num internal interface seeks s dot num internal seeks right interface steps internal steps interface seeks internal seeks great this seems good this seems grand let's recompile so the past tense of seek is of course sought even if it's an operation called seek, you gotta say sot just because it's more fun. Just because it is more fun. Let's recompile a bunch of JavaScript. Fun. It's my dream. That feel when your database takes longer to compile because of the JavaScript than the Go. Is it normal? Okay, uh, well, uh, we've still got some errors. So in stats.go now, let's go fix that. Stats.go. JFills! Thanks so much for the 11 months. And right to disk. You missed a month? Ah, that's okay. That's okay. No, who's counting anyway, right? Who's counting? Uh, what's up? What's up? We had an epic rainstorm here on the stream. And uh, it got dark, it got sunny, it got dark, it got sunny. We heard from my my neighbor who uh, yells at his dog a lot. We got raided by Primogen. These are the, the oh, and we made, a, uh, we made a three line fix to something that took like three hours, but it was a good, uh, it was a pretty good fix, I would say. Check it out, three lines, but it was, it was important. We've got a lot of good things on the stream today. I think it's been a good stream. Um, yeah, so we're chilling. We're chilling, dude. Uh, we're absolutely chilling. You guys should definitely check out Jay's channel if you haven't. Um, do it. Do it up. He's got some good, good content. Magic Mirror content. And other stuff. Um, so this kind of feels like a place where we could be using our nice new helper function, doesn't it? So we can say exec infra dot gets uh, populate scan stats, whatever, populate kb stats, s dot kb, scan stats. Yeah, nice little helper function there, done. No problem. Um, Yeah, the NYC storms in June, man, that was an intense moment. It kind of makes me feel like, do you ever feel like you wish that you had like some extra cameras on the stream just to throw around to do random stuff. I would have pointed us 
put it, pointed a camera right out the window to let the stream really feel that rain power just coming down, you know? It's like, that's the cozy mood. I feel like one thing that's common, you got the lo-fi hip hop, you got the like, the rainstorm sounds, you know, you got the coffee shop. It's like that relaxation vibe, feeling like you're co-working, feeling like you're chilling, feeling like you're at home listening to a fireplace crackle, you know what I mean? And if you have a rainstorm, a real rainstorm going on right outside your window, it's almost a shame that you can't include that in your stream for the sounds, for the visuals, for those feels, you know? That's kind of what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Um, Node stats, what's this about? Node stats. Okay. Well, this is another spot where we're gonna copy and paste a bunch of stuff. So that's okay. So we're gonna say num internal. Oh, but we haven't added it yet. So we've got to fix that as well. So num internal num interface steps. Boom, boom, boom. Internal steps. And then we're gonna copy like this. We're gonna rename this to seek. Okay, so done there. And then we're going to say interface steps, internal steps, num interface steps, num internal steps. All right. Get rid of this stuff. Copy like this. Replace step with seek. Oops. Careful. We got to do it both times. Let's make sure I did that right in the other file. I think I did. All right, so we've gotten this thing fixed. Let's try again. The old compile loop. Keep hitting recompile till it works. Still doesn't work. Now we've got to fix our explain output, which is the final piece to this whole puzzle, right? This is what we wanted to include in our explain output. So we're gonna we're gonna do it up. Num interface steps. So how about this as a concept? Uh, actually, never mind. I was going to say we could kind of have a field that has both interface and internal, but uh, that's going to be confusing. So we're just not going to do that. Let's just include all the all the detail for now. And uh, it's not going to be keys red. It's actually going to be MBCC steps. This is going to be way too overwhelming. I think it like makes no sense. Nobody, no user will care about this stuff. So I've got to figure out how to improve it. But you know, you got to start somewhere. You got to start with all the data, internal seeks. Um, yeah, aha. So verbose mode, we have access to verbose mode. So why don't we go ahead and add these guys to the verbose mode? So if e.ob.flags.verbose. So here we're going to say num interface seeks. Here we can say num internal seeks. Num interface steps. Num internal steps. Yeah. And move this guy down to the bottom. Put the internal seeks inside. So then we have a nice little verbosity control. No problem. Internal steps, internal seeks. Step seeks, step seeks, step seeks. All right. Yeah. Okay. This is good. This is good. This is good. Will it compile? It's feeling like yes. It's feeling like it's happening. I'm excited. All right. So uh, now what we can, what can we do about this? We can run a demo and see what we get. So we're going to run C demo, create table, a, a int primary key. 
So we're going to insert a bunch of data, insert into A values. Well, we can do insert into A, select star from generate series one through 100. Okay, so then we're going to say select count star from A. That should work fine. Then if we say explain, analyze, select count from A, we should get some extra information. KV MVCC steps, 100. KV MVCC seeks, two. Oh, yes. Now we are in business, my friends. Let's do a verbose. If we get verbose, we get internal steps, 100. Internal seeks, two. So that's cool. And so the next question I have is, uh, is this going to properly update? Let's say I have a bunch of garbage now. So I'm going to say update A. Set a is equal to a plus one <clears throat> where one is equal to one. Oh, you can't do that. So I have to say a is equal to a plus 1000. How about that? All right. So then at this point, what do I get when I do a select count star? I should get extra garbage, right? Or will I? So yes, I do. I get 300 MVCC steps instead of 100. Now, why do I get 300 instead of 100? Why don't I just get 200? Can anybody explain that? Is it because I of this? So let's say I did this again. Now, what do I get? I got 500. It goes up by 200. I don't exactly get that. I don't exactly get that. Oh, is it because, yeah, I don't really get that. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating. Anyway, I feel like this is uh this is fantastic. <laughs> we did it team. Now I do have to wonder, should we be hiding this information when it's exactly the same as this information that I do not know. That I do not know. I will leave that up to brighter minds. I think for now, I'm just going to fix up the test and push this, and then uh, we can talk about it more after that. So let's take a look at the test that we had to change for this. I think it's a bunch of these logic tests. Get diff, get show stat. So we're going to rerun these logic tests and uh, regenerate them, basically. So we're going to say make test based logic files equals dist. Vectorize, and I think we can put a big uh, quotation here. Disvectorize, explain, analyze, explain, analyze, plans, inverted, index, geospatial, vectorize, local. And so then if I actually run this test with this flag that we call rewrite, it's going to just rewrite all the test outputs, which we, we love to use this thing because, uh, well, if you do something that changes a lot of tests, of this particular kind where it's like SQL input, SQL output, then you can run rewrite and it's going to redo everything to be exactly what it was. And you can look at the diff to see what changed. So it's kind of like a, um, you know, golden data test. Ever heard of that? You like ensconce some data as correct. You change the code. You see if the ensconced data changed, but sometimes you want to regenerate that golden data. And uh, that's basically what this is about. This rewrite thing, golden data regeneration. All right, so uh, let's take a look at what changed here. So we everything changed to be KV MVCC steps, KV MVCC. Why don't we take a look at one of these visual outputs as well? So the visual outputs now have way more information, possibly too much, right? This is kind of overwhelming, honestly. kind of overwhelming it's starting to become too much data how do we cut down on some of this data huh? I think the answer is that we're gonna okay so I think what we're gonna do here is um well what does this function do that you pass in key and value 
value returns a time dot duration. Humanize util dot duration gives me back a string though, right? Yeah, I mean, I could I could kind of combine them together, or I could just not include the internal stuff for now. I don't know. I could be like, uh, hmm. What would be interesting here? I mean, it's it's really there's a heuristic. It's like, let's let's take a look at what Sumir wrote again because I kind of forget. Sumir wrote. C count and step count. I see. We should have actually changed this stuff instead of. I should have paid attention to this. Anyway, uh, if these are significantly larger than the ones in the preceding bullet, it suggests that there are lots of uncompacted deletes or stale pebble versions that need to be compacted away. I think I should rename all the variables again, <laughs> which is sad, but that's uh, that shouldn't be so bad. So I think we basically search num interface steps and call it instead just step count. Okay, so we're going to replace num interface steps with step count everywhere, I think. Seems safe. Except for possibly this one. No, I think this one's correct too. Okay, so we're going to do a replace all. Ta da! All right, and then we're going to do the same thing with num interface seeks. This is going to become seek count. Then we're going to do the same thing with num internal seeks is going to become internal seek count. And then we're going to do num internal steps with internal step count. All right. So now that we've at least gotten all that annoying boilerplate done, at least it's pretty quick to change it around. And I guess the last thing is that we've got to go over here and say, maybe we, maybe we just say like KV step count or MBCC step count, maybe. Step count. Um, the question is, do I want to include this internal stuff? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. Having a trouble, having trouble knowing here. Feels like I just don't include it. We're just not going to include it. It's all good. This is going to be called MVCC seek count. We'll drop it down here. All right. So then coming back to our other spot here, this is also something that changes. Instead of MVCC steps, we're going to say MVCC step count. Or we can say MVCC seek count. Journal seek count. All right, so done. So now let's let's go ahead and rerun these logic tests real quick.
All right. So how does it look now? Now it says MVC seek, seek count. I think that's kind of better. Uh, MVCC step count, MVCC count. I think this seems reasonable. I mean, the only suspicious thing is that why are these things set to zero? I think, all oh, right, it's because we redact them um, because they can change kind of, and it's confusing when that happens. So in, it, just for tests, I mean to say. Just for tests, since it can kind of change depending on the weather, so to speak. So to speak. That being said, I feel like it shouldn't really change so much in these logic tests, but... Uh, yeah, I wonder what would happen if we didn't redact those in tests. Would we would we would we be able to succeed or no? Let's find out. Had redactable field. So where's that redactable field stuff happening from? Had redactable field. Is it redactable? It's not redactable. It's like uh it's the one where we like jitter it to zero basically. Where is that thing at? Thanks for the follow. I don't remember where we do this thing. Is it, uh, Oh, is it, is it this one? Reset uint? Is it this this thing? So here's make deterministic, right? So let's just try to see what would happen if we didn't make these things deterministic. Do we get any issues? Find out. We're gonna run our rewrite. We'll see if it stays the same if we rewrite and then run again without the rewrite. Okay, so let's see. Uh, and then if we run again without rewrite, what do we get? Do we get failures or do we get success? We get a bunch of terrible failures. And why is that? We get, we expected three and two, but what we got was three and six. All right, well, that's just confusing. And I think the reason is that uh, some plans are distributed and some aren't. So it's probably different or something. Okay, that's fine. Let's just, uh, we'll, we'll keep this reset and that will just be fine. So we're going to run the rewrite one more time. Then I think we, yeah, then we should, we, we probably should be good to go there. Yeah. Probably should be good to go. Okay, uh huh. So then let's just check one more time. So get show stat, and we had to change some other tests, and we like this guy, test data prepare. So let's let's uh, fix that one. So this is gonna be make test opt logic files equals prepare test flags equals rewrite. Maybe the big image contains too many specializations to be easy to read. You're talking about that like crazy explain looking thing. Yeah, it's starting to get out of control, right? It's like, oh my God, so much information. We need to work on that. I don't know. We need to figure out how to like summarize it to only display stuff if it's relevant. But yeah, I, I think uh, that's something that we need to kind of do holistically. I'm not going to do it right now. I mean, I think that the general idea that we will want to do is like, only display stuff if it's out of the ordinary, if we spent significant time on it, you know? And in this case, uh, this is just way too much. Yeah, I agree. Well, we need to figure out how to deal with that. Don't know quite what to say there. Um, exec 
builder. All right, so git add seek. I guess I can just say git. I don't need that seek thing anymore. I forgot. Git add one through twenty three. Git commit mend. So we're gonna say add mbcc steps and seeks to explain analyze. It's awesome that it exists at all. Yeah, I agree. So four new fields to explain analyze for each operator that reads today from disk. Uh, so it's gonna be like mbcc steps and seeks as well as their internal as well as mbcc internal steps and seeks when verbose mode is toggled mbcc steps is the number of times the number of steps uh the number of times that the underlying storage iterator stepped forward during its work. MVCC seeks is the number of times that the underlying storage iterator during, during, let's see, during the work to serve the operators reads. The underlying storage iterator uh, jumped seeked to a different spot on disk. Seeks are more expensive than steps. Um, a much higher number of seeks than returned KVs indicates that there might be, that there was MBCC garbage that had to be, uh, it's actually steps. Steps, I guess it's sort of like steps plus seeks. Then return KVs indicate that there was MVCC garbage that had to be skipped over during to satisfy the scan, which could explain to a user why their scan was slower after a lot of updates or deletes than expected. I kind of wrote this already. MVCC read cancel number. Of... I think I'll just kind of keep keep the old explanation. Including stepping over MVCC keys that were too old for use in a scan. MVCC Seeks is the number of times that the underlying storage iterator jumped to a different data location. Seeks are more expensive than steps. And then comparing MVCC's, comparing MVCC steps to KV's red, it helps indicate to a user when a scan might be sort of garbage. In the middle of the key space being scanned, a high number of seeks might also indicate a lot of skipped MVCC garbage, especially when doing a skew control scan. Okay, great. Explain Analyze now contains more information about the MVCC behavior of operators that scan data from disk. See commit message for more details. All right, this seems legit, you guys. Let's push this baby up. Let's push this baby up. Um, and we're gonna say, thanks for the updated stats, Sumir. I redid this commit based on your recommendations. So far, we don't attempt any heuristics to determine when to display step seeks. We just uh, always, we, we always display them. We always display the interface step seeks and display the internal steps seeks when the verbose flag is used. Not sure if this is any good we'll probably want to do better here but uh for now it's good to get the data out there at least at least i think okay yeah 
So let's go ahead and let's equal observability. Uh, and we got to refresh this PR message as well, since the commit message changed. So we'll just copy and paste this in. Change this title as well. It's always so annoying that it, well, oh well. Just keep it like this, it's fine. All right, guys, I feel like this is a pretty good stream. I feel like I feel like we accomplished two good things. We fixed that bug uh, that M. Laswick reported to us, which is awesome. Big improvement there. So thanks again, M. Laswick, for reporting it. Um, and then we fixed this thing about MVCC steps and seeks, which is really cool. I think this is going to be a big boon, at least for debugging things, at least for helping customers when they're confused. I'm not sure if people are going to necessarily get how this stuff works on their own without more documentation yet. So that's kind of an action item. We got to figure out a way to make it clear what the heck we're talking about with this MVCC steps and seek stuff. But I think at least the data is there, right? It's like with a database, it's just there's a lot going on inside. And if at least you can expose that information so that people can get it if they need to, that's better than having nothing, even if it's confusing information. I don't know. I mean, ideally, you would only expose clear, insightful, helpful information when the user needs it, not when they have to go looking for it, you know, like you want an alert. Hey, user, your scans are slow because they're skipping over a lot of MVCC data. That'd be sick alerts, you know, and then the next level would really be like, why even alert if you can just fix it yourself? You know, the self-driving database. That's the dream. I don't know, guys. Anyway, there's a lot to think about here. Um, let's go ahead and find somebody to raid in the meantime. In the meantime, um, so let's go ahead and uh, see who's streaming. Who is streaming? Who do we got? We got Griffing. We got Stragger. We got Mizizz. Oh, we got B Dougie. Well, we gotta we gotta raid B Dougie. B Doug. I follow B Dougie on Twitter, and he's a he's cool. He does a lot of good stuff. So I'm gonna give him a raid. B Dougie yo. Um. Yeah, he's chatting. He's doing stuff. This is going to be good. This is going to be lots of fun. All right, y'all. So look, have a great weekend. Hope you get out there. Enjoy it. Do some fun stuff. Talk to your friends. Chill or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Get those spammed emotes ready. You know, we can do a little bit of Twitch raid. We can do a, bit, a little bit of tomb raid. You know, we can do the large D2 genius if we want. We can do the large D2 ancient if we want. Get one of these big old messages going. The computer's hooked into over a thousand All right, data you there. The Copy and paste that message into your paste buffer. Spam it into the channel. I want to see you spamming. Yeah? Yeah? Come on. Let's see some spam. JB Pratt did it. What about Nico Neo and Hal Clark who just followed me? Yeah. Let's get more. More of this. Yes. Okay, so we're going to get in there. We're going to say hello. And then uh, we're going to, yeah, do it. All right, y'all. Have a great weekend. See you next time. Thanks again. Bye-bye.